sec, connecting event. Okay, welcome everybody. It's 612. This is the Battery Park City Committee of Community Board 1. I am Tammy Meltzer. I am have been the chair of this committee for the last couple of years. I am now chair of CB1. And until everybody is sorted and with our sorting hats, our acting chair will be our co-chair, Justine Kucha. So Justine, I'm here to help turn over for the month of July um, and then figure out how we move along in August. Um, so we're gonna Thank start, you. you're welcome. So Justine's gonna take a lot of it from here. We have a robust agenda, some of it overview of the design changes to Wagner was presented at the Environmental Protection Committee. Oh, Judy's here. Judith Weinstock just signed on. Sorry to interrupt you. Right. Thank you. I'll move her over. Just give me one Thank sec. you. Excuse me. Sorry about that. Judy. Yay. Yay. Thanks, Thank Judith. You. Okay. So one of the things for the Battery Park City Committee to remember is very often um, updates, depending on the schedule of the Battery Park City Authority, have been given at the Environmental Protection. Since um, some changes came quite um, late, um, I don't know about the outreach that was done. I know I was surprised by some of the things and one would have thought that um, I might have been in the know. So the first thing we're gonna do is go over the changes that were done for shown the slideshow that was shown in environmental. If you have, if you got the agenda, hopefully you had a chance to click through. If you didn't have the agenda, this is gonna be a, a quick, swift, swift overview. We have both Nick and Eric on the line who can answer some mild questions. I don't know about detailed questions because that belongs to Gwen and her team and AECOM as far as I was to understand. All and right. they're not joining us, right? They could. They were unavailable this evening, so it was either show everybody or not show everybody tonight. No, no, showing everybody. Yes. In the future, we are working on our listserv. So, if you would like to be on the email list for the environmental protection, which will be reviewing all of the resiliency plans of Battery Park City in detail, please make sure that you email the office or Justine so you can be on that specific email list, even if you are not a part of that committee. All right, Lucian, do you mind hitting the slides? All right. So I'm, am I taking it from here, Tammy? Uh, yeah. Your call. Your call. I mean, whatever. I mean, how comfortable are you with the presentation? Or you want Eric? Um... I was going to have, well, I was okay. going to ask Nick or, and or Eric to kind of go through it because I was not at the last meeting, although I haven't been at the other meetings for the environmental okay. committee. So, Nick, do you want to do it with, with me or you want to do it on your own or Eric? I don't know that Nick is here. I haven't seen this. Yes. Oh, he is. He is. And he can unmute himself. Here. Um, sorry about that. Yeah. Um, no, what I was prepared to do, Tammy, is, you know, there were uh, items that we covered. So if one has the context, good afternoon, everyone, or good evening, I should say. So we did a an update with the Environmental Protection Committee on June 15th, two weeks ago, uh, and committed to coming back to the community board um, later this summer or in September when we have some substantial updates, we didn't have a whole lot of updates from that, that last meeting on what we discussed. Um, but if there are questions on um, what is in what was in the Environmental Protection Committee uh, presentation, okay. then uh, yes. I'm certainly okay. happy, I... happy to take that feedback and, and right. bring it back and answer as best I can uh, I mean, from the Lehman's perspective. I could do that. Right, so let's... I have a lot of questions. <laughs> well, yeah, there's going to be. All right. So let's go through the conversation that um, Battery Park City Authority came through with us in the environmental protection meeting was about the picnic lawns. We have long advocated for less cement and more picnic lawns, more commiserate to what the experience in Wagner is currently. Slides. And the conversation, go ahead, Lucian, next slide. The conversation was about moving lawns from the right side when you're looking at the screen which is considered the south side further over to the north side the circulation maps that you see have to do with the ways that you may experience and, and 
experience the yeah. park, whether or not you are um, mobility challenged. Go for it. Yeah. I mean, sorry, so the conversation, there were three parts of the conversation and the presentation. This is part one, which was the discussion of the removal of a South Picnic line and adding it to the north side. Next slide. There's me. Just there the, the, the very first picture that we saw is that being changed by what these slides are, or is that the result of all these so changes? This was the current design that they showed with more, uh, more walls and clamping, less lawn on the north side. Yeah. Next slide, please. Lucian, next slide. Option one is uh, you can see where they have added an additional lawn area on the north side that is still has universal access. Go ahead. Next slide. Option one shows that the elevation difference from the esplanade up to the top. So there's a 21 foot rise from the point of the esplanade to the top of where quote unquote the lawn is. The additional lawn areas would be staged up as you see here and flat to the walkway. So at the 16 foot elevation, you would be able to access the new lawn spaces that they've shown um, in the top right. Go ahead. Option two was also presented at the committee on the environmental. It was not widely appealed and because of the ADA access and the access in the elevations, it still provides a lawn entrance and access. It's a little bit wider of a lawn, but you will see. Go ahead to the next one, please. In this, the lawns are tilted, so there is no way to have a flat lawn. So it becomes a three foot tilted lawn from actually a little bit more. So this was a conversation with people on the environmental and the resiliency. There was no resiliency benefit either way. It was simply a design and most people agreed that they would prefer to have direct access to the lawn, especially in the thought process of kids and um, mobility challenge to be able to be flat to the lawn versus a step down with people potentially falling. Next. That shows it side by side. You can certainly see you know, one of the downsides for option one is it seems to be a smaller section of lawn that's added versus option two, which has a deeper section, but these are not necessarily finalized. And it was unclear to the people in the environmental review as to why you would have had to have lost the south lawn that was also desired. So the summary from these presentations were that they liked option one out of one and two, but they wanted to retain the south lawn as well in whatever form it was. And that the, the possibility of adding not more natural plants for them to attain, attain wedge design could be done in the um, pavilion area or other areas and that the, we, the request was to go back to the drawing board, find ways to add more native plantings and less cement. Next slide. The people that are not talking mute their microphones, I think it's Nick's microphones, it's like pretty distracting. Thank okay. you. I muted Bob Zack too. All right. So that was the update for the lawns themselves. And we're going to talk about all three of these afterwards so we can have the feeling from the homeowners coalition as well. Um, this is a dialogue about battery place. And this is the front scape of, oops, let me take a look at my attendees. I think there's somebody in there I might need to move over. Um, Eric, moving you back. All right. Um, this is the front scape change to battery place. There was 
a long amount of dialogue on this, and I think Nick can jump in and unmute when I or Eric. It was not widely um, happy. There was a lot of concerns. You can see that the where the people are walking on the bottom of this slide, that is the sidewalk, and then there is a very tilted elevation to get up to the 21 foot, which is the height of the elevation. That entrance that you see center in the block is actually a service entrance for restaurant workers and trucks. So there is no pedestrian access from there, nor public access. Public access is only from the far south and the far north. Next slide. So this shows you what they're talking about from that driveway that you saw. It's, it's just, as I said, park service carts and food service carts. Um, next slide. This was the first internal draft study that they showed us. Again, I'll go over the committee's feedbacks, keep going. So this shows what it would look like um, in terms of the front. So the bottom half is the sidewalk and then those are basically just terrace planted areas um, and a full ramp up and a full ramp down. Go ahead, next slide. Study two is very similar, but in um, response to us saying that we didn't like the fact that you couldn't have any type of access from the front of the street, there is sort of like a seating area that could be walked up as in long steps that you see that's more towards the south side of the service entrance. Next slide. So you can see that's more of a seated pavilion, but you know, what are you looking at is the question you'd be looking at uh, the Wagner from that perspective and the street. Go ahead. Hey, you're looking across. That makes sense. And it's not much to look at. Um, okay, so this is study three, and this provides ADA access. This was, um, again, in response to the conversation of not having any access towards the front. And here you have on the north side a the seating area like you saw in study two and a ramp added on the south side for three. And what that does is it's less greenery in the front as shown by the next slide. Mm. Strangely, it doesn't show it. That's Okay, um, that's study four, and that's pretty much what they have now where it's uh, just large green swaths. Keep going. That's an elevation look at just the large green swaths. Again, there's no entrance access for the public except on the north and side, very similar to one. But the difference is instead of multi sections of varying levels of planting, it's just kind of a large hill. Walk on, right? Basically, you can't get from point A to point B unless you go to the edges and go up Correct. the hill. Right? Correct. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so here are the shows of the different uh, studies, the impacts to the planting coverage and how that might look. And so you can see that. The top one, which is the first one, has a maximum planting uh, availability, but doesn't provide any type of access to the street level. The second one has a proposed stair and handrail wooden amphitheater seating on the south side. And the bottom one has a proposed handicap ramp and seating, slope planting beds um, around that. Next slide. Okay, so this one caused a lot of consternation um, in dialogue, and we'll talk about this as well. For the, I think if you live here and you walk there or bike there every day, you have a far different idea. You can see that the major pedestrian circulation and the bike circulation does not necessarily work out because the dialogue became the fact that you're not providing a place for bicyclists who are coming off the bike path that are on 
in Battery Park, if they are not crossing onto the Greenway, you're then pushing them onto the lower levels of the Esplanade, which may or may not be functional because if there's an event, you're not going to be able to go that way. So then you're forcing people to go up the allays up the hill with all of the pedestrians. Thus, when you take a look at the circle points that they have as their intersection points, you will have bicyclists, skateboarders, and everything else riding up and down. Next one. About the skateboarders on the hills. Yeah. So these are design changes that uh, were the conversation keep going. And again, what you're seeing is that in the center, there's no direct access. So this is the main access right now. Um, what they don't show is right uh, just past that fire hydrant on the left is the crosswalk to uh, the school that's there. That's the edge of first place. And you see the major access way going up to the pavilion building. So you can either be on the sidewalk on street level or go up the LA. Um, if you've missed the LA and you're on the sidewalk, there is no access until you get back to the corner of Pier A or you walk back to the Jewish Heritage Museum because that area in the middle is service entrance only. Next slide. So this is the entrance coming from the edge of Pier A. And the concerns that everyone raised was that if you are a bicyclist and you've come right past Pier A, you're either going to go straight down on the Esplanade or you're going to ride up. There's no bike path and perhaps the, con so we'll keep going. And the concerns that uh, were raised by Bob Schneck last time was, yes, there may be a railing, but that's an awfully long way to go. And you can see circle seats and other things. Go ahead, next slide. the plantings, you know, the concerns is they are looking to blend in with Pier A Plaza. Um, you know, we of course all love the native palette because that's what we're used to in Battery Park City by the Incredible Parks team, a really more natural look. So hopefully that's what they mean by blends in with Pier A Plaza versus changing what's the natural look of the gardens that we so admire and like now. Keep going. Okay, let's go back to, I'm gonna do, oh, I can do drainage now too. So this is the interior drainage, this is part three. So part one, you saw were the lawns. Part two is the streetscape side of Battery Place. And the updates from that from EPC, people were very concerned that there was no bike path that allowed people to bike without going up with the pedestrians and down with the pedestrians. There didn't seem to be if you were if you were older or handicapped accessible, the questions were if you were making a service entrance, couldn't you put an elevator there to get people up and couldn't the service entrance, why does it have to be directly in the middle? Couldn't you rethink the service entrance to a side and have access instead of it being a main gate front without access to the park? Does that mean the gate open up right by P PSIS um, 276? No, the concern oh, is that main gate is a service entrance only to access the LAs to get to the park comes from the edge of the Jewish Heritage Museum from the very connected edge there. Okay, so for example, if you were parking buses, you would hope that the buses do not back up into the residential building or the crosswalks, but all right, interior drainage. This interior drainage, there are many things that were presented that they need to do in terms of the underground water, which is something that we're very familiar with and we've advocated for them to fix for a long time. They're looking at the drainage here. There needs to be two places that they are able to access the system. The conversation became is the plan is to put one in the north and one in the south. However, there is a possibility they may need two in the south. And these are to check and see what's going on 
with the drainage that is below ground, which we know is what flooded, for example, over by the Millennium and the Wagner. Next. Lucian, next. So the map that you're looking at, the important parts to look at, you've got Wagner where they're doing the flood alignment and they're making that resilient. And then they have the other sections. They're looking to put in gate, they call it Southern Gate and Control House Zone and Northern Gate and Control House Zone. We are advised that there is a potential that they will only need one gate, not necessarily two. And that is something that we're gonna need to opine and comment on either through environmental and Battery Park City or from Battery Park City. Next slide. Those gates that you showed, that it, it could be both of those oh. or it could be one of them? And then we another need... one in the North neighborhood or? Correct. That it could be, okay. Correct. And we didn't see the picture of the North neighborhood yet. Because they don't, they're not that far along. The goal. Yeah, just that would be part optimal... of the North. That would be part of the North Battery the Park City keep... Resilient. Right. The goal the would main, be to keep the one predominant of the part of the conversation. Of the yeah, the predominant conversation was to hopefully see if we can design it as such so as to have one control house in the south as opposed to yeah. um, as opposed to two. So that's that's yeah. let's what we're talk operating about under. That. Let's talk okay. about that control house. So this Sorry. is this is what they're talking about that's needed inside. All right. So this is not, you know, some place that's it's not some place that's accessed routinely other than for repair and maintenance. Next slide. And there are cylinders and machines in there. So here's part of an example of the gate. This is not our neighborhood, so keep going. This is the shape and size of a cross section and elevation. So the building in itself at its highest point is 13 feet by two inches tall. The length of the entire thing is not specced on here, but it's 10 foot at the lowest, 13 at the end. And if you can kind of take a look and, you know, do the measuring by where they are, it looks to be at least 30 to 45 feet based on scale. 45 feet long. Actually, if you look at the scale, it's more like 60 feet long, potentially. Twice. Okay, next. So this is an example. It's a flat metal, metal tile on the roofing and the exterior is brick or glass brick with a granite base. And you can see from the height what they're talking about in terms of a normal size human being walking by. The aluminum windows are all uh, above head height. So it's a granite floor, a brick wall and windows start um if you base it i'm assuming that's an average six foot tall person on the uh, measurements for the detailed render okay keep going okay this is slide one that shows what it might look like it's interesting in its perspective of where it's located simply because they are showing it alongside of West Thames, I believe that looks like. I'm not sure, it actually. Is, it no, that's the one on the east side. That's on uh, FDR, along FDR Drive. Oh, that okay. picture right there. Yeah. Right, so that's resent, that says representative example of the North Gate. So that's mm. a gate that could be, for example, up by the ball fields, somewhere on the north side, somewhere we don't know where. So on the bottom, it says South Gate building view from the Southwest. On the top, it says North Gate, not sure which one it is, but next slide. Here are the potential interceptor locations that they're talking about. We did have a long, long dialogue about putting it instead of where they are suggesting one is they're looking to take out a large chunk either in the promenade area which is option two i believe what they're showing there 
Option three is in the bike is in the grass and tree area to remove the grass and tree area along Little West Street. And then existing tide gate is the purple box. And what they said was you have to be within a certain square feet from the interceptor gates. Our questions and have not been answered yet are whether or not they can be located in the crosswalk because there is a large area of crosswalk that is not underground that is over by Morris in between first and second. It's an extremely large area and occasionally police cars are parked in there. Next slide. And the answer you can see where they're talking about the off ramp, they said it is not feasible to put it above the Battery Park underpass necessarily due to what it needs subterranean. Our argument back to them is there are places along the DOT route there in the medians that could fit this. The answer that we had thus far was it's not necessarily desirable because of the access. But if they're not accessed on a daily basis, I'm really unsure why we would put something so large either in the promenade or in the greenway. The other question that I asked Nick that I'm hoping he'll be able to answer on this call is whether or not you'd have to alienate parkland because the promenade is mapped parkland. Next. Oof. Same things. Control locations. Next. So this shows what they're talking about. You can see the Wagner on the right, the, the orange box for what they're looking at looks benign, but you have to imagine all those trees would go away because you need to build something that's 13 feet tall by about 40 feet. Okay, so that's taking out part of the promenade itself for the footprint looking south. Next slide. Wait. wait. Tammy, let's see. I don't know what the next slide looks like, but on this slide here, the promenade. So that's the road. Then that's the walkway. That's the Little West Street. Street. They're talking about putting yeah. it in the promenade. And where and where you want to put it is where? the next. Hold on. Yeah. Well, where I want to put it is in the middle of 9A. Yeah. I mean, that's what I'm saying. We can't quite see it here, can we? No, because they okay. weren't necessarily okay. happy about the thought. Right, right. Okay. Just making sure. All right, let's see, Eric, whoops, sorry, Eric, I'm moving you over, Sarah, I'm moving you over, Eric, moving you back. Okay, so next slide, please. So that's a 13, but okay, so here are the advantages and disadvantages. It reduces the concerns that I have is it reduces the width of the pedestrian promenade. It also puts a 13 foot tall by 40 foot length building in front of and alongside uh, the cross area. I guess the question I'm going to be for Nick is about the retaining wall is if we put it in the, in the middle of West Street. We have to move it far enough away from the battery park underpass that it's not going to interfere with the retaining wall. But there's so much That's, space in the middle. There's no retaining wall there to worry about because even okay. putting it in the promenade, it says it's a, away from the retaining wall. Yeah, oh. Perfect. All right. No, that's this op this option is away from the retaining wall. Option one <coughs> is by the retaining wall. Okay. Next. Okay. One. Next. And, and while they say option two, the control house does not remove green space, it removes park land. So, okay, option three, again, potential um, promenade and greenery. If you can go to the next slide. So this is removing all of the trees, but leaving the promenade in the width that it is. So in the space that you see there, um, you lose 
the greenery that would be there. And again, you've got a 13 feet tall by 40 wide building that's there. So you would have Little West Street. You'd have the building of, of the Wagner. You'd have the street. You'd have the gatehouse control house building. Then you would have the promenade, then the grass, and then the greenway. Is, is, now, is now a time to ask questions or are we just listening? I'm hoping we're at the last slide for goodness sakes. Uh, we're close, I think. Lucian, go for it. So there are the benefits for option three. Mm. Next slide. So these are the mitigation strategies. There does seem to be flexibility, the places that they the concerns that the community have or do not seem to match with the concerns of. This slide is actually good for showing a constraint that they're, they say they are operating under, mm -hmm. which is that the gate that this control house controls needs to be south of that M9 box, which you can see is basically right there at first place. Hmm. And what they said was that was optimal. They didn't oh, say it was impossible. No, that's not oh, what perfect. Thank that's you. Not, because it's supposed to be controlling the flow below that. That that but spot. They okay. did say that it could go further north, and that was no, in no. part of the diagrams when we when we discussed it on the call. And whether Nick or Eric can speak to that, I'm unsure. But That's if you not what I think they said that the control house could go further north as long as it's yes. within 200 feet of the gate, but the gate had to be south of N9 itself. Right, and the gate is on the right. It's the control house on the left, on the west side that we're talking about. Can you enlarge but, that one? Yeah, may go back again. So, so the two things in blue. So, what's what's so, what's offensive? Right. So, the small one's the gate. The small one's the gate. It doesn't yeah, bother us. It's underground. That's right. Not so, so Lucian, if you can go north a little bit on that photo. According to the engineers, that north. little blue box needs right. to be south of M9. Right. And the big blue box needs to be within, I believe it was 200 feet of the little yep. blue box. So the conversation yeah. was nobody thought it was a good thing to take space out of the West Thames Park because to build a 10 foot gatehouse there, because that is the lawn area for West Thames Park, no, no one like that. There is not, I mean, and the conversation was that that might not need to be done if there's a gate in the north. So the second south gate might not need to be done. If you can slide back south a little bit so we can see, put that gate at the top there. So, oop, yeah. yeah. So the conversations that we were having are, if everyone who's familiar with crossing West Street is that whether or not it could go into the large median crossing that's over by second place. Hmm. It's a long, a very large and long median that's um, zigzag shaped. And the answer was they it was yeah, inconvenient it thus far that the they said that it would be inconvenient for them to access it. So I'm going to leave that where it is now and let's do Q and A. And yeah. Everybody can, um, if you raise your hands, I will recognize hands first as a way to go down this to make it a little bit easier. And Tammy, can I ask that Lucian um, with his mouse point to what you're talking about? Yep. So the part so, will be, and then yep. I think Jeff has been waiting patiently to talk. Yep. Jeff, my house. Jeff. Jeff Myhock, go for it. Can we go back one? Yep. Maybe Which see, slide? go back one, see where that is. Wait for the AV to catch up to you. Yeah. There might be two slides. One more. Okay, right here. Um, 
why couldn't we have that if it has to be in this vicinity? Why can't we put that, move that to the left and put it in the median planter between the promenade and the bike lane? Is there a reason why that couldn't go there? Well, no, I think that might have been option. I, no, you know, we, we didn't ask that question. So we, there may be some utilities or something, but I don't think we asked that question. Because that seems I don't like, I mean, is. that hotel. Although, if you look at the diagram, you do see some utilities running under those uh, trees. Well, I was just wondering, I mean, it seems like a natural place to put it. It would buffer sound from the hotel. It's It would be removed further from the hotel's entrance. Uh, it would not block a sight line of cars driving along that area and seeing a pedestrian walk right out by that fire hydrant into the line of traffic. Um, that's a heavy traffic area right there. I live a block from here. This is where a ton of taxis are, a ton of black cars, a ton of tourists, a ton of Ubers and Lyfts coming and dropping people off at that uh, hotel. And if you have that thing there and it's 30, 10 feet tall, it's going to be a sight line blockage to people crossing the promenade you know, right there in front of the cars. And also, why not move it further away from the hotel? And, and Jeff, you're talking about the traffic on Little West Street, correct, at this moment? I'm talking about the traffic coming right at us right now. Yep. Yeah, Little West. People walk from that promenade Agreed. crossing right there, and there, and these cars don't always, there's not a stop sign there right now. There used to be a long time ago, I think, but there isn't now. So people try to cross there, and you have to watch it when you're driving because people just walk right in the way. So. Why not move it so it's not blocking a sight line? So it's in the middle of a median of planters. It can have maybe ivy growing. I don't know what can grow on it or if anything can grow on this thing or not. But I don't know why why it needs to be that close to a hotel. I mean, so Jeff, this is a reason. What about what about Tammy's suggestion, which is yeah, no way in heck does this one make any sense. The other one is in the pedestrian path, so it's over a little bit, but I think that also would be blocking the sight line as you're suggesting. So let's move it into the middle of West Street, the middle median of West Street, the West Side Highway. Right, we've given them that request to look at that right. option. I'm asking now, Jeff Myhoff, do you have an issue with that one or do you see a problem with that, assuming it's possible? Uh, I don't think it's possible down here. I know that area really well, and that really isn't. Yeah, that's what I'm right now, that's the up and down ramp into the underpass. It's, it's parallel where it is there. Well, it would have to go north because of exactly that reason. And so that that's the in, the engineering inquiry is if it were north, where you actually have a median, is that close enough to where that gate needs to be located? And they were going to look into that. Yeah, that would be even more ideal. I'm also wondering, are we going to discuss? Uh, I, I'll ask now. Like, are we going to discuss the placement of one of these kind of eyesores right near that beautiful park where the kids are playing, or is that a Thank good idea too? That, that one is unlikely to be built as as they presented to us. That, that's kind of a placeholder, um, the, but I'm not sure what the location. The, the, they need a north one, but the yeah, north one would go in the real north neighborhood is what they're contemplating. Although I don't know where that location would be. It may be. Well, there's an absolutely huge median right parallel to where that is, as we all know, who know the area. Like the, the median yeah. down here where this right. one is is not very large. The median up here where the, where the northern one is placed right. now is an enormous median. It's 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 tall. It's huge. It's got a ton of planters on it. Um, yeah, that's a good point. I yep. can easily go there. Agreed. All right. So, if, taking, Tammy, if I'm I can just, notes. if I can just, and thank you, by the way, Jeff, that's both Jeffs. That's really helpful. The one thing, and Tammy, you did a great job on going through it and kind of um, recapping it. The one thing I would add, and it's only one, um, I don't believe it was a matter of the control houses necessarily having to be within 200 feet or 200 meters, whatever it was, although that's the preferred distance. It was, if it gets further away, it needs to be bigger. So if you don't like the size of the building now, gonna it's going to be beyond 200 meet feet away. But that, that could be okay if it's, if it's not. The building is small. Yeah. Oh, but if it's in well, the yeah, media, I mean, look. we don't care if it's in the middle of West Street. You can, you know, it's not going to no, no, no. In, fact, in the middle of West Street might actually provide a really interesting sound absorption barrier for the traffic. Exactly. So that might not be a bad thing. You know, it's really or... interesting. It's it's really interesting. We should, uh, you know, you should certainly, um, we should certainly make the request. And the one thing I would add is, again, as we're working through this with a wide array of partners, DOT, DEP, and PDC, um, 
so far to date, I don't want to speak for the Public Design Commission, but our experience to date has been the Public Design Commission is keen on keeping a fairly consistent aesthetic for these types of structures. So I think that what they're going to want to do is try and keep them look consistent across all the projects. So whether it be Battery Park City or Eastside Coastal Resiliency, um, et cetera. I don't know how much wiggle room there's going to be. Um, I don't want to speak for the PDC, but I also want to make it clear to the folks in the call, it's not just the Battery Park City Authority's call as to what these things look like. We are bound by the constraints that we are given um, in a number of matters on this project. I understand but all that. The, same, the feedback say... we want, we want to hear it for sure, and we will make sure that yep. we incorporate what we can into our next round of updates to you guys coming up. Nick, I want to point out that each location that they do this in is vastly different in its geography. So there is some level of accommodation that needs to be made per location. Agreed. It, it just, you know, we speak for CB1. I don't speak for the other community boards. I speak for CB1. And so we will only advocate for what's best for us. And if that helps inform for what other communities do and they learn a good lesson going there, more the better for the others. Great. All right, Jeff, anything that you have on the other two issues about battery place or the lawns? Which Jeff? My hawk. My hawk. Anything else you want to say on the lawns or the front of battery place, bike path, anything along those lines? No, I couldn't really see much of a difference between the two lawn proposals. It seems like they're roughly the same size. They're um, similar. How do you feel about losing the south lawn? Back to that slide. Yep, we we were of the more lawns better. Yeah. All right. Lawns better, but I also it's also like hard to tell in these renderings because you know when you're really there, you go by there a lot. It's it's really not that much lawn space already. If they start cutting in with like a lot of crisscrossy paths, well, I think that's part of the whole idea, right? They've got to elevate it, right? They can work with natural plantings, and that's a dialogue that. Um, is going to be part of the next topic on this or part of the first one as well. All right. And the front of the um, battery place, the uh, two side entrances, middle entrance. Can we see those slides? I, I don't have yeah. that memorized. Yeah, I would be helpful to see the slides I'm again. I'm quite getting the in service entrance versus the regular entrance. So I wouldn't mind trying to figure that out a little bit. Clear to me which was which. Uh, there, are, there is no main entrance. The main entrances are on the north and south. You cannot access through the middle. Can we see that slide? I'm not seeing it. Yeah, Lucian, you, you go back. Is Lucian with us still? Yeah, he is. I mean, as we look at these options, we should keep in mind the design constraints that any option has to satisfy. One is that elevation, and the other is universal access, which constrains the options. I challenge that. I completely challenge that because we there's no have universal access or no, of course you should. But the question is, you know, what kind of considerations did they do to have a longer tunnel to have, you know, the oh, service? No, I'm not saying that these options uh, explore all the permutations possible for those but, constraints, but I'm just saying whatever options are chosen, including different ones that Indeed. We keep going back by those constraints. Thank you. I want to get to the rendering. So, like, maybe that one. Okay. So, what is this elevated area, like the arch that's in the bottom right? That's the service entrance. That's only accessible at this point in time by hotel, uh, restaurant people or whatever, correct? No, no not place. restaurant guests. It's a service yeah, yeah. entrance where employees. You say there's only north and south entrances. I don't see a north entrance. I, I would consider that right now. I'm looking at not the service, but above it. That's that to me is the eastern entrance. So, do you see the ramp that goes up on, from the left? Yeah. And then the ramp goes true. down on the right and ends in front of the Jewish Heritage Museum. Yes. Those are the two entrances. There's no entrance in the middle. Oh, oh, the okay. sidewalks. Yeah, you're, you're saying not entrance to the um to the path. Correct. I was or to get to that level. Entrance to the park. 
may not get into the park. This is where the universal access affects the options that they presented to us. This, this was their preferred option, in some ways the least worst of the options. And we wanted a, an entrance in the middle there to the park, but to do that because of universal access, uh, access you need long ramps, which takes out uh, a good chunk of that greenery as was shown in some of these renderings. So what's the middle option? So, so the, one of them, this is a little frustrating. It's a very steep hill too, isn't it? I'm, I'd be interested to hear what Marianne Breverman has to say if in regards to seniors or even Betty with, I guess, to see what it would be like to push a wheelchair up that or whatever. Two story rise. It's a 21 foot rise from ground, from ground. It would be designed to, yeah, it would be designed at the, at the, the ADA um, so prescribed okay, grade. That's why it, that's part of the function of it being as long as it is, is that you have to have it be very gradual. I'm not sure of the okay. exact degree, apologies for that, but that's the idea is that it needs to be designed in a way so it's not too steep for folks to be able to get up. And Jeff um, Galloway, thank you for bringing that up. There were some other slides in the presentation that I know we went through, uh, Tammy, and thank you for that. That kind of really explored it is a little bit of a, of a tough nut to crack because you need to have universal access meaning for the uninitiated anybody in a wheelchair or a assistive device needs to be able to enter the building at the same point in the same way that other people would you can't simply put a staircase right next to that service entrance that people go up and down um, How can somebody asked about an elevator yeah that's yeah does, right. that, is that, does that qualify as universal access? I, it's a good question. I don't know. And I have to check on elevator. I don't know what the feasibility is for an elevator. Uh, but again, you know, when we come back with our next round of uh, updates, we would have that. Uh, I would assume, and I'm not an architect, so I can't say this, but it's okay. I'm not if, you can, if you can have no ramp on the West Thames Bridge and an elevator, <laughs> that sort of seems to me that an elevator would operate. Betty, do you remember? Betty has her hand up. Betty, please go. Yes, I, I was going to say that elevators are always a problem. They're very expensive. They break down all the time and they're used by people to urinate in at night. So they always smell horrible. Besides that, so in terms of adding things and limited capacity, you put one stroller on with it, the lines will be huge to even be able to use that if it's a party that's coming, a bunch of people coming around the same time. So I don't see an elevator as positive as other people do because I have to rely on them. And believe me, nobody wants to have to rely on them. Okay. Especially uh, with social you distancing, you could have one person at a time go up, you know, maybe if they're with somebody, they could have one other. It would be not useful for many people. Uh, I know the long ramps bother people, but I'm kind of used to them. So it's, not a big deal. I wouldn't get dropped off in the middle. I would get dropped off on the edge, as would anybody else who's entering this way. I had no problem with the picture if they want to have a staircase in the middle for those who are hardy enough to do it. It means splitting some parties because you'll have some that can't take the stairs, some want to use the stairs. That's not that socially that great if you're being dropped off. If you are arriving by foot or by bicycle, you're going to easily come in through the north end or the south end, so it's not a big deal to just use as is defined here in this photo, in this picture. There is no bike lane, Betty. There is no accommodation for bikes. All bikes would have to either ride on the sidewalk. There's no bike path. That, right, that but they can be one anywhere. in the street. But my point is if they come to the area by bicycle or if they come to the area on foot, they're going to have to leave the bicycle wherever they leave it. They're going to have to still, they're going to come from the north and they're going to come from the south. So it's not a big deal to start walking on these ramps at the ends because you're coming from one direction or the other anyway. It's really only the people being dropped by cars. So right. I would not put the option with the ramps in it to eat up some of the greenery because it doesn't help. The person who needs a ramp can just go to the ends the way they are in this picture. There would be no advantage to having the other added. That the ADA accessible to have this picture here with stairs added uh, there's they have one there um right. there was one option they have it is an option yes that might be the best it, adds, option. it adds a ramp though as well for yeah i thought there was a ramp as well I thought that there was, was another option hence ramp and then there's one there was no oh, no no yeah, i think you got to go back you, you go the other yeah. way yeah sorry there were four options 
Uh, let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see. Betty, so, anything um, else on the how on so the I'm, ESCR houses or the lawns? This one is a ramp. Keep going. No, that's the one that that's has. The one you just had. The one right through that one. Uh, that before one. that. There's a lot of stuff. Yeah, but that has a ramp built into it as well. So, right. Big ramp, but all the green space is gone. No, no, the one you were just. Right, that's one I back. said I would not get. This right. one you would not get right now. This one go back one, please. Correct. If mm -hmm. someone needs a ramp, it doesn't help them because you, you go up and then you curve back. It's the same distance as just coming in from the south of the north end. And can can you go to study two? Built in. Okay, study two is with uh, a ramp in embedded into the stairs there this is and pretty horrible too this is all this is two this is two uh study three lucian you yeah, go to that picture of study three study three study three they did not provide an ele oh, go back one please i apologize lucian yeah sorry study three <laughs> One they second. Have a, if you stop here and straighten out that ramp, it would be it would take you right down to where you'd be coming in anyway if you used a regular sidewalk. So that would be what this was designed for is you lose a lot of the greenery, but there's a ramp on the left and the stairs to the right. This is where the committee asked whether or not you could have the stair like things there and also an elevator in the center to provide parity if possible, if that would work. Why do you need so much stairs though? Right. I mean, why, why can't you just have a staircase? I, I, I couldn't tell you, that's their designs. Oh. I mean, I'm not sure well, why this, that to be so big either. But these are shallow stairs. If you use really shallow stairs, so each one is just a slight lift up, then you do need this kind of width and depth to do yeah, it. Yeah, but, but my guess I, I, I know you're saying that. I get it, but my answer is if people want <clears throat> if people want to walk or need to have this the slow, uh, you know, low grade slope, they take the, the slope. If they can walk up steps, they take the steps, and it should just be a staircase. Maybe if you want to stagger it, go up a flight and then move it over a little bit so you get a break and then go up another flight. But this is a crazy waste of grass area. The other one's a crazy waste of grass area. But I don't. It's not really it. grass. It's it's a green hill. Greenery, whatever it's going to be. But yeah. But but I, I think Betty alluded to an interesting point, which is, what are we trying to accomplish with right. an entrance at that point? It's making you know, it who, easier. Who for wants people. to enter at that point, other than people being dropped off on cars in cars? Well, so it, also from a little it also provides additional seating space. It provides it, it provides something on the streetscape side versus nothing because right now there is a lot of activity on the streetscape side both from the building that's there the the alleys and the artwork there's nothing in the plan that they have it almost looks one of the one of the members of the public said it best it looks like the park has turned its back completely mm -hmm. on the city and it is only looking forward whereas the park as it currently exists Faces part of the city ha yeah. has has interesting aspects of it on both sides. Um, interesting, but I don't know that this accomplishes the same thing. Kind of pick it. All of the options kind of suck. Sorry, sorry. Okay, all right. Let's let somebody else speak. Betty, are you done? Are you, are you good? Yeah, no, I agree with Justine. I think adding cement versus green is not a positive. It's the question, I guess, becomes how can they accomplish it with both? Because that doesn't seem to be a conversation that's been had yet. All right, let's get to Bob Schneck. You had your hand up next. Uh, so I, I think as a, a place where I can actually say something positive is I really like the idea of that big median of using that big medium median in the by the west thames bridge because gotcha. it's it's there it's practical it's usable and um it's it's way out of the way and it's a place where you could actually without harming anything uh make that necessary addition so i see that as a <clears throat> as a facility that we have to have 
and that's and if it's something that we have to have that would do damage uh, in other places, then I think that's a place to put it. So I have the odd, um, at least for me, the odd, um, I have a bunch of odd biases here. And so I'm going to name them and then I will be quiet forever, I think. My natural bias is that I'm really, I've really been pleased with the way things are here, just as they are. I'm very pleased with the, I think that the gardens we've had for years are wonderful. I feel like the way uh, Wari created the batteries, wonderful. I love Wagner Park the way it is with the structures it has and with the restaurant it has. I love the grass as we have it. I love the battery battery place performance space that's used sometimes. Everything about it kind of works. I, and so I admit a natural bias here. A, I, I think that the way things are are pretty good. And I also have a bias about how to protect them. And the bias I have about how to protect them is I feel like we're now facing some very difficult economic times. And I've always had a basic fundamental concern with what I'll call economic justice, that we here have this very charmed life and other people don't. Now, lots of people who actually live here are going to have a less charmed life because <laughs> I think some at least from the people I talk to and meet, there are some people who are going to have difficulties that they've never had before. That being said, I think that that redundancy, as I've I've thought for years, is a really, really, really major issue. And one of the opportunities that, in my opinion, if I were a, a ruler of this process, would be to to drive economical solutions that could work anywhere that would kind of solve the uh, solve the resiliency problems without building huge um, restaurants or centers, without tearing up that uh, those wonderful gardens, without changing those spaces uh, in front of Pier A that I'm very comfortable with, without disrupting those existing bike paths that uh, that worry had. So I would ask that we uh, focus on coming up with the simplest solutions, not spending a lot of money, using that money for other things, because there's going to be more other things uh, that people have to worry about than ever before. So I could um, enter into all of these discussions about which one of these uh, 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 what kind of advantages are there are to this entrance or that entrance? I really don't like those that uh, I really like the way it's organized now, and those uh, stairs going up from the uh, from the Hudson River up this huge incline. I've always been very uncomfortable with piling all that dirt uh, up in the East River Park. I think piling dirt is is at that scale isn't really uh, a simple solution. It's a massively complex solution. So so that being my feeling, I could also enter into the refinements of of the difficulties of, you know, I think that now we're going to have more and more people on more and more uh, kind of little electric vehicles. We're going to even need to think of new parking spots and imagine new ways to handle those, because if you have one, you wouldn't park it on the street. You'd try and get it up to the up to next to the restaurant. So I think lots of new complexities are happening, and we have to think about and design for those. So if I took the design that we have near that this resiliency has for those those barriers near to the near to the uh, Jewish Heritage Museum, those are really simple. I would just take those across toward Pier A. I would not build that big hill. I would block out whatever, I would try and respect whatever sight lines I could that exist. But if they go away, they go away. And we simply have to accept them because in the same way, if you necessarily have to have buildings to support uh, some underground uh, operations, then you have to have them. If, you, um, if we break some sight lines, we have to have them. So that's just how it is and we should, be very responsible for being as economic as possible in coming up with solutions. So I hope that's helpful. 
thank you very much, Bob. And you'll, that's going to make a great segue to the next topic. But um, I want to make sure that we've given everybody a chance to opine and say anything um, if they wanted to. So we heard from Jeff Galloway, Jeff Myop, Judith, or Eric. Do you have anything? Or oh, Sarah's got her hand up. I apologize, Sarah. Go for it. I just have a. a this is a probably a retroactive question. I'm wondering if it was ever discussed um, simply raising, you know, the way Bob suggested doing something right along the edge, um, but making a promenade on top of that. So that, yes, you have the park with the usable workable spaces, but you also have a new vista up there. So, yes, you have a wall that is a green wall, maybe, or, or you know, a waterfall something on the one side and the, well, probably not a waterfall, but it could easily be a beautiful green wall with plants on, on the interior side and then have the promenade just go up. It could even, it could even ramp up and, or you could just make that the space for the elevator. But I was wondering if that was ever considered because it does seem to preserve the things that people use and yet give us a place to go to get the vistas and jump in there um if it's helpful uh yeah so actually and thank you for that it's a really thoughtful suggestion we had gone through this process i want to say maybe it was last march all the presentations are comprehensive BPCA resiliency project website and I'll go, I'll last go March, it. I believe it was, but to answer your question very briefly, well, it seems to make sense kind of from a philosophical perspective, very practically, there are two immediate challenges. One is if you were to build some type of intervention, we say intervention, we mean if you were to build to block the, the floodwaters. If you were to build it right at the end, it would have to be So you would block the view of the water from everyone inbound. And everyone in the park or on the street wouldn't have a view of the water anymore. They would just be viewing the back of the wall or slope up. But even more practically is because the esplanade is cantilevered over the water and not actually at the water, not at the, the, the uh, bulkhead, it wouldn't be able to bear the wouldn't be able to bear the weight of whatever it is we were going to build. Ah, uh, okay. So it's it's engineering. Yeah. Okay. It's probably predominantly engineering uh, an engineering challenge. Thank you. Okay. Of course. I uh, noted in the chat I cleared everybody's hand raised by accident, but I do remember Bob Zach had his up next. So we're going to call on Bob. And if anybody else does want to put their hands up, Lucian, I see your hand up. Uh, you can go after Bob Zach if you don't mind. Thanks, Tammy. I'm, I'll be very brief. Um, I, I wanted to revert to the discussion about the uh, gatehouse. Uh, the South Gatehouse, um, and just make a couple of brief comments. I think the idea of placing it on the street um, is is a very poor choice, um, and the alternatives of placing it at least in the median planters is a, a less worse solution. Placing it on the street does several things. First of all, that will be obstructing the view of the traffic coming up Little West Street uh, for people, particularly children who are crossing at first place. Yeah. Um, to have the addition of a building that's X number of feet high and X number of feet long. That poses a safety hazard. Yeah. Secondly, it's an aesthetic disaster, certainly for the people who live in the Ritz-Carlton and who walk along those that street. Facing a wall like that that looks like Hitler's bunker is not going to be a very attractive solution or do much to enhance property values in that building or anywhere else on Little West Street. Um, and there are alternative places to put that. Uh, the median solution was probably the best in terms of its aesthetic appeal, whether it can be done from an engineering perspective, I leave to my my betters and and more wise uh, people on that particular scope. But it that simply cannot go where you uh, where that one alternative proposes it on the street um, for a variety of reasons. Thanks. That's really all I want to say at this point. Bob, thank do you. you. Can I do you mean in the can... promenade? Yes, that's my question. Did you yes. mean in the promenade, Bob? Uh, the, yes. The other, the other, the other fact is that placing not in the promenade itself, but in the planters that are between the bicycle path right. and the and the promenade, 
that actually yeah. reduces the least amount of greenery and trees, whereas putting it on the street, you're removing three or four major trees that provide shade and a great deal of attractiveness to that vista. OK, great. Uh, Marian Braverman, you're next. Let's make sure I'll unmute you for you. There you go. OK, so I had sent in a few chat questions and I don't remember them all because I was popping them out as we went along. Um, uh, Lucian may have one, them, so Lucian. OK. Uh, I know one thing I, I'm concerned about is any walking spaces have plenty of seating along the edges for people who can walk somewhat but need places to rest, catch their breath, and so on. I did not see plenty of walking, uh, plenty of seating. Yes. The diagram that was shown showed seating around uh, the tree near the bottom, yeah. but mostly yeah. open uh, with a railing and not as much, no. But so, I will so. put that note down that no matter how for access, seating is important. And then I also did suggest that some of the, some of these structures might be able to have plants, ivies. Um, if you're familiar with that security parking structure at the World Trade Center. Exactly. They have that wall of plants with different colors and it, it's, it's beautifully done. I love that. Really place. well done. Yeah. So something like that would, would help the appearance of things. I, I think will that's that. probably it for me. Thank you. Lucian, do you by any chance have uh, any of the chats that I was scrolling back through those, Tammy, and I don't see anything from Marianne. It, it could be that she, it may have been a, a private chat or, or or some other, but I'm not seeing them in my chat log. I, I sent it to all attendees, so I don't know where that went. Uh -huh. I know uh -huh. participants I is another yeah. option. Yeah, participants. Uh, if you send, all right, so for everybody, if you send a chat to all <laughs> participants, it goes to everyone. If you send it just to attendees, it goes to the people who are not panelists. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Which, Red uh, Taylor standing right here, and she can move her questions because she's an attendee. Uh, yeah. If you just want, if you oh. transfer that, yep, that's fine. Is that, is that helpful? All right, I'm, I'm going to let her speak. Okay, Go ahead, so Taylor. Marianne wrote at six forty-four. Might it be possible to have hanging plants, vines, a wall of okay. plants? Okay. Good? Okay. Next. Also, buildings should not block visibility around the bike lanes. It's bad enough when plants. Oh, these structures, visit. yeah. And yeah. then she asked, is the hotel closing? No. No, I don't think then so. Then she said, okay. there should be seating along any walkway for those who need a breather. And she said that. Okay, and then that's yeah. it. Okay, perfect. That was yeah. it. Thank you, Taylor. Yeah. <laughs> great. Okay, great. Um, do yeah, I have great. anybody else? I, no, I think we're good. I'm going to turn it over. Okay, Justine's going to run the rest of the meeting. I have a couple of questions, Tammy. Okay, go for it, Lucian. Um, so about, about one is the uh, trees, the trees on the, the mid-level. Um, I didn't see a slide for the tree selection. Are those all going to be saltwater tolerant trees? The slide. I'm going Sorry, to go Lucian, yeah. to, uh, I'm going to go the wrong way. Hold on. So like I'm depicting, let's see. Yeah. So the, the trees that are in the lawn area, the mid level that are expected to be flooded in a flooding event, say, you know, Might have connectivity difficulties. I see a little spinning wheel of death above his I, face. I may have shot through the slides too fast, and the the server's trying to catch up. There's a bit of a lag. Let me know, and I can unshare and reshare it if there's an issue. Is it no one seeing the okay. slide, current slide? Uh, you're on picnic lawns option too, not on the. Yeah, so that's what he wanted. I think he wanted the picture of the 13 foot lawn. That's right. The, so for anything, any tree that's kind of in the in the expected flood zone. Um, I would hope that uh, a, a very salt water tolerant variety is chosen. I, I have a lot of experience with Harlem River Park, post Sandy, 
um, that park was flooded and all the trees died because they they were not tolerant. It's horrible. So it's something it's something that's I think it's a really important choice to make that you you get a really hardy to saltwater um, species of tree. Eric, it looks like Nick um, might be having technical difficulties. Do you know the answer, Eric Munson? I don't offhand, but I do know that that the horticulture practices are of, of primary concern. So we can take this back, and I can get a, a firm answer to Lucian's question. Sure. Thanks. And the other the other um, thing I was curious about is for the for the uh, control house for the gates. Um, I may have missed this, but it, it looks like they're all contemplated to be built at grade with the, whatever street or or plaza or media that they're built on. Is is there any way to to build them a couple feet below grade to, to tamp down the height issues. What, what's preventing it from being um, somewhat submerged, so to speak? So somebody who wants to enter it would have to step down a couple of steps. I love that question. I don't know if there's like a like a can, could you, like some sort of pump. I'm, I'm having trouble following you. Can you can you try again? I'm I'm sorry. Oh, one second. Let me just um, go back here to. <laughs> yeah. So, for example, let's see if I can get into here. So, if this were to be sunk down a couple of feet. Or however much it's possible to sink it down, and you just have someone step down to it. Would that would that do anything to kind of reduce this height? Is it possible to submerge it to you know some degree? Is there something about the the water level that prevents that from from being submerged or or lowered down below grade to some degree? Could you still insulate it from 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 water, is it or is like this height necessary for some reason? This like this this height here. My assumption is that it's not an issue with regards to height so much as it is a consideration with regards to the depth. But again, that's something that I would want to confirm before I answer definitively. So I'll I'll check yeah. with Jenny yeah. and AECOM and the folks and and get back to you on that. Yeah, it, it seems like a lot of the issues here, you know, just depend on. How submergible this structure is, because the difference between a, a you know 11 to 13 foot head house, gatehouse control area and uh, an interesting bench is is that <laughs> that amount of submersion. So, also pursuant to that, Eric, if you're checking, can you find out if you need to alienate parkland if you're going to put it in the promenade or the planters? I wouldn't sure. sure if they took that space, they would be alienating it. There's a process for that. So ah, that's what I want to ask you. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say, I think the answer is yes, but okay. <laughs> I think. All right. I think. Are we good to go on to number two? Are we good to go? Yep. Hey, I mean, I, I, is that space not state DOT property? I thought that it was, I thought the space was owned by state DOT, not, not parkland. Uh, all I remember is that Governor, Governor Pataki dedicated the promenade. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's why we so, call it the Pataki that's, Highway. So. That's why we call it the Pataki Highway. So <laughs> you know, that is one of the things that we would want to understand is because it was there's a dedication ceremony and Pataki talked about it being a grand entrance, con you know, connecting the the battery to the rest of Manhattan through this beautiful park. Hey, so, Tammy, sorry, Nick's board down. I, I uh, lost my connection, but I called back in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, we thought so. Can, 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 can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, sorry. Um, so, Lucian and I apologize. Let me take the first question first. I cut out just when I had all these good answers for you all. Um, we're talking. We're talking. I don't, I just because, can, can you hear me? Yes, but Eric may have answered the question for you. 
Well, no. So Parkland, I don't, I don't know that Parkland alienation applies here. Um, simply doing something in the park does not necessarily mean it's Parkland alienation if it's for an otherwise public purpose. But I am far from an expert in the in the matter. I'm going to have to find out if that would apply. But I will will have an update for you as part of our next as part of our next presentation. I don't know that it would apply in this case. Um, I'd imagine if it did, or if it didn't. My guess is it would probably be consistent across the residency projects. So if it applies in Battery Park City, my guess is it might apply in East Side and elsewhere. I don't know for sure, but that would be that would be my guess. Well, we'd like to know if it is, and if it is whether it would happen as a whole or it happens as um, in sections, because you're on state land, you're not on city land, and you're a state authority. And what in, and how that works. Right. I hear what Eric's saying yep. that it might be state DOT, but it was dedicated to the community um, by Pataki. So that's what we'd like to understand. Right. Well, two separate things, right? If it's the promenade, I think that's one thing. If it's the median, then that's certainly state DOT. Depends on where we got, um, Correct. We're specifically we talking with, about with, the promenade and, right. and the area and the planter areas. Um, while I have you here, Bob, I know you had mentioned it, Bob Zach, so I, I jotted it down. I want to make sure I have my notes right. You said you'd like the median option the best if it's possible from an engineering perspective, but then secondly, you'd like the planter option better than you'd like the promenade option. Is that correct? The median in between the bike path and the promenade versus because it would be least what he said was it would be least confusing to people having access crossing the street if it's in that zone at all. Right. Okay. And then Lucian, I'm sorry. Um, you were asking questions about plantings when I when I when I left and then something about the control house, I think, flooding. Sorry, I just didn't want to miss that. No problem, Nick. Uh, the question is about the the trees that are in the flood the kind of the design flood area. Um, if right. those are going to be um, saltwater resistant species of trees selected. Okay. Yes. I'm not, my understanding is just that uh, I think I said I will we'll confirm, but I think that that's the idea that you'd want to try and have them be hardy, but I don't want to speak at a turn. I think so. Yeah. yeah. I'd love to see that. I'd love to see, as I saw the slide on uh, other plantings that were saltwater tolerant, but I would yeah. be interested to see which, which trees were, were kind of in the mix for, for that. Okay, and then the question about control houses. Yeah, the, the, the question there is, um, to what degree can those control houses be sunk into the ground? So is there what, what, what sort of engineering issues prevent the, the control houses from essentially being built below grade, not entirely necessarily, but oh, enough. I see what you're saying, right. Yeah. So it's still 11 feet high, let's, let's say, but if it's, if Five of those feet are underground, and it's really six feet above, only six feet above grade. Right. Um, for as an example. Okay. I don't. I don't know. I don't. I don't know the answer to that. But very good question, and um, probably a combination of uh, expertise from DEP, maybe somewhat less from DOT, and then the Public Design Commission, of course. I think would want to have a pretty consistent aesthetic. But really good question. And then that's not considering any any uh, kind of subsurface utilities we'd have to navigate around, but. Certainly something to ask about. Thank you. Sorry about that, guys. I'm on the phone now, so you can't see my face, but that might be an improvement. And then uh, I'm just going to go back to the lawns and go back yes. on record saying that I see no reason that you couldn't take a look at making retaining the south lawn and keeping a north lawn and finding ways to incorporate native plantings within the amphitheater that you're building in other places to be able to reduce the amount of concrete. If you are, I know neither Eric nor you live in the neighborhood, but every square inch for every tiny lawn area has been, ha has been filled with people <laughs> since the weather has turned nice. It is one of the heaviest utilized parks and every grassy area has somebody with a picnic blanket on it, no matter how tiny, whether it's over by the sculpted um, gardens, there's a little lawn area there, 
and there were groups of people on it, the big lawn, obviously, and even the terrace lawns going down to the water. So one of the questions, yeah. we're, you know. Yeah, the, 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 on one of the overriding things we've heard uh, in the beginning, um, and we're in obviously full agreement is that we want to try to maximize, maximize room space wherever we can. So we'll continue to do that. And I know that the, the addition of hardscape has been something that you've been after um, for a while. So we'll continue to look at ways that we can minimize that. And that also goes back to the, the entrance at the, the, the question about the entrance to the pavilion, if there's a way to kind of soften that a bit um, and try to get at some of the goals while still trying to have green space. I think that's, uh, I think we're in alignment there. So yes. Which then brings to the point, Justine's taking it from here, yeah. about the fiscal and physical distancing concerns for Wagner Park resiliency. Yeah. Uh -huh. All right, so thank you, Tammy. And um, so basically we wanted to bring this topic up for discussion um, after looking at the Wagner Park, the latest design for the Southern Battery Park City. In light of what's going on with cold, the whole uh, coronavirus pandemic and COVID and the New York on pause and physical distancing, and also the shellacking that our economy has taken since February and March because of the virus, and really truly not much of an end in sight until a vaccine comes, um, which might be 2021, 22, 2022, God forbid. Um, in light of that, one of the things that we were talking about, and we've invited Bob Zach to talk about it, but we also want the committee to talk about it and think about this. Yeah, sorry, hold on one second, because I think I'm getting a food delivery. But give me, I can't mute myself. Um, so sorry. Um, train of thought. Part of what we want to do is have this conversation because one of the issues that we are faced with is Southern Battery Park's resiliency is based on the idea that we have to protect our community, all of Battery Park City, as well as, well as all of Lower Manhattan from flooding. However, the area where Wagner Park is focusing on in terms of the pavilion of the building, that never flooded. That hundred year storm never madden, managed to, to dis destroy property or lives in the hundred year storm. Now, clearly it's not going to survive a 500 year storm. We're not looking at that quite yet. So the question that we're looking at and proposing today is focus on what must be done to protect property, save the money that you've raised and push it towards other things in Battery Park City, such as resiliency for the individual building, which is also within your purview of protecting and maintaining property. And I wanna open this up for discussion for the, for the committee. Let's see if I can find any hands raised. Sarah Cassell was raising her hand. Sarah? Oh, sorry. I had raised it earlier. Um, I was wondering what, if you've specific, specifically, um, if, if Nick and, and company have looked at where, um, what the cost would be were they to focus on resiliency for each building? I think the, well, go ahead, Nick. I think the answer to that is no, because they haven't looked at it that way, but go ahead, Nick. I don't see Nick. Okay, he's not there. Yeah. Well, uh, he may not be on the phone. I don't know why. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, now we I'm can. Here. I'm yeah. here. Yes. Okay. Um, so actually, it's, it's, a really good, it's a really good question. Um, and again, what I would say here is that, and some people are new to the topic, what we are doing in Battery Park City is part of an overall approach that the city of New York is taking called uh, it's Lower Manhattan Coastal Resiliency overall. It contemplates a continuous, what would be when it's all built, a continuous flood barrier from as far as the 23rd Street on the east side all the way down through two bridges around the battery, up through Battery Park City, and then ultimately above Battery Park City, oh, up on the go. west side. It's coastal resiliency to protect vast swaths of Lower Manhattan. There's a slide that we repeatedly show, and Lucian, I can throw that, I can turn it over to you now if you don't mind bringing it up, but it's just it's a slide we put in all our presentations that talks about the amount of um, 
amount of land and amount of buildings we're protecting. And if I have it right, um, our South Battery Park City Resiliency Project contemplates flood protection for 100, I want to say it's 120 buildings and 14,000 residential units. So we're talking so, here Nick, a matter of scale and scope that is um, this conversation much more is effective than it would be to go building by building. Building no, by building. Let, let me be taking their own measures to protect themselves, but what you should talk about in the field and field of resiliency, what we repeatedly hear is that you want a layered approach. So you want buildings that take more individual means, but you also want flood based coastal protections to protect and give additional layer of protection. Exactly correct. I'm not, what I would suggest, I understand Sarah's question was, was a little bit different, but the suggestion that I'm saying is not in any way, shape, or form to change one iota of your plan about resiliency and protecting property. What I'm asking about is whether or not we have to go through the expense of renovating a restaurant and um, building more space for the Battery Park City Authority at a time when there's such other urgent needs, such as parkland and park space and open spaces for the people in this community and all of lower Manhattan that are flock flocking to us. And if we can push this off, Push off some okay. major stuff. That's my concern. Not in any way, shape, or form challenging what you're doing every place else, but bringing and putting in temporary measures to, to, to like what you've done with the ball fields. The ball fields, we decided the temporary measures we're going to do are cheaper and better than building something out and then tearing it down later on. You know, so it was a really great solution. What I'm asking right. is to come up with something creative in Wagner Park about the building. So the answer there, I want to set the expectation. Um, the answer there is, is full. I can you hear you. Is your can you hear me? Go ahead, said the answer there is right. that it needs the rest. The, the, answer, the answer is no. Battery Park project is of a piece with the rest of the all the components of it is one piece of one system. And the South Battery Park City Resiliency Project itself then ties into what will be the West Battery Park City Resiliency, North Battery Park City Resiliency. And then to the east, we're tying to what the city is and what the rest of LNC are. You'll recall the conversation we had about the ball fields, which is a very productive moment the community board, as they all are. We ultimately decided on doing a, 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 an interim solution at the field that would then be able to be scaled back once the north and the south Battery Park City Resiliency Projects were in place. Because the assumption it was built upon is that the North Battery Park City and South Battery Park City projects are permanent projects. And once those kind of pain points or pinch points are sealed off, you would no longer need to have that extra uh, protection at the ball field. But if you were then going to turn around and own South project temporary itself, then you're losing that protection you would have at the ball field. And they are then again exposed. The idea is to have a continuous flood barrier, the Museum of Jewish Heritage, down to Wagner Park, across the area plaza, and across the battery. If you don't fulfill one of those gaps, then the rest of the project is useless because the water will simply flow around what you've built in the place you have not built. So it has to be one continuous system that blocks up waters and accounts for sea level rise. And in the case that we've seen earlier, also takes into account that interior drainage issue, which I know was so problematic. 100% the, the interior drainage issue needs to get addressed. What I'm looking at is not knocking down the building at Wagner Park now. I'm saying do it in two years or three years once we can actually have open spaces again and we can go back inside restaurants and we can have a lot less of this nonsense of, well, it's what's the reality of right now, but the social distancing that we have to live with right now and not imposing upon or taking away more public open spaces from us now. And in the meantime, come up with a temporary solution that is not expensive, that will pick, pick, kind of fill in the gap just by the Wagner Park area, because a lot of what you're planning to do must be done, has to be done, totally get it, and it's totally structural and it must be done, but does it have to be done now? Question. And I'm wondering what everybody else on the panel thinks too. Yeah, the, the, the panel should weigh in. I, I would just let you know that that's not an option for us. We okay. we, we need to we need to move on this as, as, as quickly as we can. Um, in the past, just to give you some ideas of kind of stats, in the past year, so in 2019 alone, 
there were 14 individual storm events across the country that caused at least $1 billion worth in damage. So, so well, as we said from the beginning, as much as we wish we didn't have to do resiliency at all, it's either we take these measures now to change the park for the better, or Mother Nature changes it for us, and then we don't have the option. We're in a race against time, and we need to do this as quickly as we can. I don't so, want to be an alarmist. I'm being, I'm being fearless. These are the numbers. These are the, this is the science. This is the data. So thank you for that. Um, a question for you is what portion of the overall Southern Battery Park City budget is the cost of Wagner, just Wagner itself? Is it like 10%, 20%, more or less? Oh, what? Are you talking yeah. in terms of cost-wise or in terms of area? Cost-wise. And then also area, just to see how big it is, just, just the right. Wagner, Wagner Park itself. Because that's it's the only good, part that's good. in contention. It, it's a good question. So what I would want to do on that one, and this isn't a pun, this is just because I want to make sure I'm giving you the most, um, kind of the most wholesome and accurate answer is, once we have the final design complete, and then we're able to bring on the actual, the, the contractors and the, the work, the, the, the folks will be doing the work on the project, actually breaking ground and building it. Um, I would imagine at that point, and I would defer to Gwen, I know she's not here, but I would imagine at that point, we would have to better set some of the particular project um, components and how much they would cost. I would say the rule, as we always try to do in Battery City, is that to the extent that we minimize the impact and phase it in a way that so always want to try to do, um, once the project gets underway, we also need to make sure we're phasing in a way that we can get it done as uh, expeditious as possible. So I guess that's a long way of saying it's conceivable that the portion in Wagner Park gets done after some other places. Yes, I don't want to speak on the project, but it's not going to be. It's going to be a year. Right? It may just be that you know we do other thing and then you do that, but it's it's, it's all a continuous project. <sighs> okay, um, I think that Bob Zach uh, wants to say something, and then, and then Barbara Ireland. Uh, I do not have the sure. power. Thank and also, and thank you, guys. Thank you. No, thank you, Nick. And speak when you speak, Nick. In responses, go slowly because your connection is bad. But um, I don't. Oh, I'm have, sorry. No, okay. no, it's okay. I don't have the power to unmute anybody, so I don't know if Bob and then Barbara are unmuted. I think I unmuted Thanks. myself, Justine. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, Nick, the the concern that Justine outlined, I think, is shared by many that the the proportion of costs that to the overall budget that you've got for just the Wagner Park facility seems like pardon the, the bad um, the bad comparison but you're you're putting a rolls royce in when the rest of us are are kind of straggling along in a volkswagen and there there is no there there isn't a a, a a tangible plan that we've seen to protect all of battery park city in in the same uh time frame i mean you're you're moving along very rapidly with a very expensive very expansive plan for Wagner Park, but I think as Justine outlined earlier, there's there's not much there by way of protection of the residential and commercial properties in in Battery Park City. That's that's part of this budget, and that's a big concern for us. We have our own inflatable ring that goes around our building, but I guarantee you, it's it's not gonna it's not gonna last for the three year storm. Never mind the twenty year or fifty year or hundred year storm. So that's the concern. Why spend all okay. of that money now on Wagner Park when you could be doing many more um, interim steps that would at least alleviate the threat until you get a better sense of the overall need? Well, good question, Bob. I would take exception with the idea that we're not protecting commercial properties um, and residential properties because, again, as I said, but the South Battery Park City Resiliency Project contemplates is protecting that entire swath of, of Lower Manhattan. And the reason why South Battery Park City, um, the project that we started uh, design on first, or very in very close, close timing wise with the ball fields, was because the areas most affected by Hurricane Sandy, you recall, was the hinge by Pier 8 Plaza, where the water poured in. Uh, and then the, a, a rail behind Stuyvesant High School on the West Highway that wiped out our ball field. However, 
Lucian, I'm going to send you something now, if you don't mind um, doing it up. But one of our prior presentations that we made to the community, I think it was South Battery Park City Green Project meeting number two. Um, we had a modeling, a coastal model, of what would happen when the next uh, under your storm kit. Um, if, if, can, if you can bring that up, it's short. I'm going to take a ton of your time. It's maybe a nice less than 90 seconds. But it shows several iterations of wave iterations, and then it shows what happens if nothing is built in Wagner Park. And it's quite jarring to see. Again, I'm not being an alarmist, but it shows that all of lower Manhattan is essentially like that. But Nick, like that, I want to say in the, now. What we've done then is, and Lucian can play these uh, again, I'll send you the second one we did in January, was that same coastal model under the same conditions, assuming 30 years, 30, inch, 30 inches of sea level rise by 2050. And it shows what happens when our South Valley Park City Resiliency alignment is in place. And you'll see that it protects all of the areas that we're talking about. Residences, commercial establishments, subsurface infrastructure, et cetera. So um, that's exactly why we're doing it. We're not doing it to redo a park. We're redoing a park because we have to have resiliency. And I really would emphasize to the committee, that's the frame through which you should see it because that's the frame, that's the truth. We are doing resiliency because we have to. This isn't a vanity project for us. This is definitely necessary. Nick. I, I think we're going at it and, and, and kind of dancing around the same thing and yet not reaching the same conclusion. Um, yes, Pier A flooded. Other places within, um, you know, Gateway Plaza had to be evacuated with no elevators and power to the flooding in the building. And then there's other things where the underground water came in. Thank goodness you guys are addressing that. And you are. What I'm saying is use whether it's deployables or some, something else at the moment to protect and connect the pieces by Wagner Park until such time as we are able to go back to normal, life as normal with, with the, um, after the virus is no longer such a, such a threat to people. Because what's happening, what will happen is construction will start, Wagner Park will be closed, they will be will lose a big chunk of outdoor open space. And what we're saying, what I'm saying, and I think that Bob would support me is, again, at least present us with the options like you did with the ball fields. How expensive would it be just to put up temporary deployables in, in the event and have that as the option if there was such a storm plan that would be uh, a threat once again to buildings and property and lives in the interim? And why am I saying that? Because people in Battery Park City are hurting. This whole city is hurting. I mean, you know, it's 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 terrifying to me because I'm still, you know, um, let's put it this way: democracy for Battery Park City is still saying 300 million is enough, and I don't see how we're going to do everything that needs to be done, and still have the conversation about affordability, as in uh, in Battery Park City. We have no deal on Gateway Plaza yet. We are still looking at ridiculous pilot and, and there's all sorts of stuff that's outside of this conversation. However, this conversation is vital because there's money that you guys got for bonding that you can maybe take and help out some of these buildings that can't make their plans. Um, uh, remind me, is it Law 97 or something, Local Law 97, about having the buildings having to be in compliance with um, uh, retrograde or retrofitting for... for um, that's right, Justine. It's Help Local me. Law 97, Climate Local Mobilization Local. Act, Thank which you. Uh, is an immediate uh, immediate requirement for buildings to start planning for. And if they can't afford to do that, they're going to have to face fines. I can't imagine anybody not wanting to do that because it's going to help the rest of the rest of the uh, the, the world, the country, everybody. It's going to help everybody. It's it's not it's not a bad thing. But however. If there's no money to get it done, how are we going to function? We have to, I guess what I'm saying is too, is how do we balance this all out? And I'd love to have the conversation and I don't know what monies of the bonding, that money that you've already taken out can be spent to help the buildings, but I'm going to assume the bond is for resiliency, but helping the buildings retrofit 
could be resiliency. And that doesn't necessarily only have to be the condos. That could be the, the, the commercial buildings too. You know, I, I'm open to any discussion, um, but I want to call on other people too. So I should give you an answer, chance to answer. Um, and then I should call Bob Schneck because I think his hand was up. Betty Kay wrote something in the chat and so did Judith Weinstock. But did I, did, I think I skipped Barbara Ireland, but I'll come back to you because committee members are now speaking. So Barbara, be patient with me. Bob Schneck, please. Okay, I, I just wanted to say, um, to address the, the question Nick raised about urgency, I've been fighting about urgency with various committees about this since Sandy. So I have uh, yeah, been a decade of experience in worry and in, 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 in concern about this. And I think that my concern has always been about coordinated New York City planning for lower Manhattan. And I've always thought about how important it is to straighten out things with the Army Corps of Engineers, how important it is to straighten out things all the way from 23rd Street all around to our very expensive uh, economic plans for Southern Manhattan on the east side, all the way up past Tribeca. I've been concerned for that whole thing. And now uh, I think agreeing with Justine, I'm very concerned about how much money we're spending on this now. And from my point of view, it's a case of very extraneous opulence. We're going to have something very beautiful. The opportunity, in my opinion, again, if I were the boss here, is to say we have to figure out how we can do things that are inexpensive and practical and and spend money with really excellent engineers to figure out how to do this as inexpensively as possible so that we can help help ourselves up along the um, up along where Tribeca is, for example. I think that we should pioneer uh, economical solutions, not look at all of these at kind of destroying what's beautiful already and replacing it with other beautiful things that might be a bit a little bit more beautiful but from my point of view are made of tinsel and so i would rather see us focus on on there's so many places there's so many problems here we have this uh we've had for years another thing i've cared about which is the leasehold problem uh to work on so there's lots of things to spend money on here resiliency for all those buildings kind of addressing climate change all this stuff costs fortunes and so where should we be spending fortunes and how much what are the timelines of these things like and i think that as a community board we're all responsible for seeing these things in in kind of lined up sheets that show us how much they cost so we see all the line items and then we get to respond to the line items it's one thing to respond to beautiful looking uh, architectural renderings. It's another thing to look at paying for them, and and so so I can't I can't if I were the person if I were the executive who for whom they bring these 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 proposals in front of me I I would stall before I would sign them, and I think a lot of us who sit on this committee who have a sense of of kind of humility isn't quite the right word but of of kind of appropriate scale we'll kind of say well do we really need this do we really need to spend that much isn't what we have already very remarkable and beautiful and special so anyway that i'm i i think it falls in line with the concerns that justine started this with and i i fully agree with her thank you bob thank you um Judy, do you want to say anything, Judith, or no? Uh, yes. Um, can you hear me, Justine? Yes, thank you. Um, I, I would just echo um, your comments and, and Bob's comments as well. I mean, you know, we talk about resiliency and we talk about sustainability. But, you know, in my view, sustainability is a really important word here because we're talking, number one, about the environment. Um, we're talking about also financial sustainability. And for those of us that want to live in Battery Park City for a long time, and we want to make the money last, there are just a lot of reasons why some of this just doesn't make sense. It's, it's 
really expensive. And as Bob said, we have something beautiful. So, so I say that in order to sustain us environmentally and financially, that maybe we do what Justine said, we, we put this thing on pause. Okay, um, can I, Justine, can I answer a couple of those concerns? Would it be helpful to the committee? Sure, it would be helpful. And then I'm gonna call on Betty Kay after you. Sorry, I was on mute and I couldn't work the chat. No, 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 no worries. So first to Bob, I would say thank you, Bob, as always. Um, you've been, I think, to a board meeting or two of ours and they're all streamed live and, and online for access after the fact. But let's just show that our board always looks at the most Cost effective way of doing things. We want to make sure things are done in a, in a top notch fashion and to the world class standards that better cities before, but also obviously done in as most cost effective manner as possible. So, what is opulent to one person might not be opulent to someone else, but these are not things that we are looking to overspend on. We are looking to spend exactly as much as we need to um, to make sure that, again, hundreds of buildings. And thousands of residential units are protected as one continuous integrated system. Um, and there were discussions. Uh, we directed the committee back to the discussion we had, I believe it was last March, and we talked about what the community wanted to see Wagner Park be um, as a result of these changes that need to be made. And one of the options we put out there, and we can direct to the, the presentation, was maybe we don't want a building at all. Would that be something the community wants? And what we heard overlooking was no, we like the fact we want food service there, we want a building, we want a place to be able to go. So in every step along the way, we've been responsive to um, community concerns within the constraints and within the realm of knowing that this this needs this needs to be done and it needs to be done um, as soon as possible. Now Judith made a point about affordability, um, and that's an important one as well. I'd like to to bring that up. One of the things that we're seeing in our research is that, uh, believe it or not, uh, places throughout the country and, and world, but especially in the country, that don't have adequate flood protection and resilience measures in place are actually seeing increases. People who are homeowners might not be able to even get insurance on their homes or flood insurance if they're in an area that doesn't otherwise have flood protection. We're seeing bond rating agencies beginning to downgrade um, bond issuers, like the Battery Park City Authority, who don't have appropriate measures in place. So I understand the concern that this is not an insignificant amount of money, but it's money we are spending to protect not only lives of the people who live here and countless properties, infrastructure, public parks, public amenities, et cetera, but in a very real way, it protects the investment of everyone who lives in Battery Park City, because if we don't do resiliency, then you're not going to be able to get it. You may not be able to get insurance on what many cases is what you put your entire life savings into, which is your homes. So we are mindful of that. And uh, it, it needs to be done and needs to be done as soon as we can. And the last point I would make for now is we've had this conversation a number of times, but take a little bit of a, and it's not the really most straightforward thing, um, but the money we spend on resiliency through the issuance of bonds, which we are in a very lucky position, like necessarily the city of New York is, is that we are able to finance these projects uh, ourselves through the issuance of bonds, which allows us some more flexibility and some more kind of aggressiveness in getting these things done in a timely fashion as possible. Um, but the money that we spend through the issuance of bonds or the issuance of debt to finance these projects does not one iota affect what you as a Battery Park City resident pay in your pilot or pays in your ground. They are two entirely separate tranches of money. To put it another way, if we didn't do resiliency whatsoever, which for all the reasons I just went through, I think we all really want to do, that money would not go back to Battery Park City. It would simply be more money that goes through to the city of New York. It would be less money for Battery Park City and more money for the city of New York. Which is the bond the money then? bond money, which would still then incidentally turn around and be building a residency project, except probably in five to 10 years from now, which means five to 10 more years, you've been exposed to storms 
and not having the protection to be able to get insurance potentially and to see the bond rate increase, which means when in Battery Park City is working on a project that you really do want, we'd be able to borrow money not as cheaply as we do now because of our sterling bond rating. So it all ties together, but it has absolutely no effect on what you pay in time. Because as you guys know, right, we get all the money we get the Battery Park City collects each year. The first thing we do is pay our debt first, and then the next thing we do is pay our operating budget, and then everything that's left goes through to the city of New York. If we're paying less in bond service because we've issued less debt, that simply means more money is going through to the city of New York. If we shrink our operating budget, that means more money is going through to the city of New York, and it's less but, money staying in Battery Park City for the benefit of Battery Park City residents. But, Nick, you've already done the I – mean, tell me if I'm wrong, and, and, and then I'm going to let Betty speak because she's going to, I think, support your position. Um, yeah. You've already, you, the Battery Park City Authority has already asked for the bond, has already been given the bond to do all this. So the money's, you know, there being set in a, in a bucket someplace, being set aside to take care of these projects is how I understood it, number one. But number two, the city needs money now. We, we've got a budget short, shortfall. There's so many issues that are going on. Um, I don't know what the answer is. I don't know what the right answer is. But at the end of the day, I fear People are going to look to Battery Park City and say, oh, you're a cash cow. We'll just keep charging you and charging you and charging you. So your idea of, I mean, it's great to say everything goes back into the Battery Park City. We pay all this money and it comes back to us. Who cares if we can't pay it? And I, you're at the point now where it's breaking. Where we, the people who live here, we are breaking. We cannot keep going on the same pace that we're going. And yet COVID-19 happens. Our, our, our economy is shot to heck. The city needs money. Where is that going to come from? And how is that going to balance out with our need for relief? I'm trying to come up with creative ways to do that. And I hear everything that you said and nothing that I'm saying, or I think that Bob Schneck said, or that um, Bob Zach said, or, or Barbara Ireland, who said she agreed with us in the chat. No one's saying don't do the resiliency. I'm saying do it. I'm just saying that maybe do something cheaper just to protect us all for a little bit. And then maybe, yeah, you have some extra money left over. What you do with that extra money, if you can help the people in the buildings do the 97A, um, you know, match up to that law and do that and use that money in Battery Park City for that, if there's a way to make that happen, great. If not, maybe the city needs more money, but then they can also not raise our pilot. To, to create and get more money. There's right. a lot of connections here. And I hear what you're saying. And we're talking like over each other. Um, but I'm not going to interrupt. I'm going to let Betty speak. Sorry. Betty, go ahead. Hmm? From the last couple of years. Uh, because the reality is, it sounds like what you want to do is let's save money and build our community on a foundation of sand. And then when it washes away, we'll all be shocked, but we saved money. I'm afraid it's going to be very much penny wise and pound foolish. As the engineers said over and over again, this is a foundational project, one that they know with time may need to go higher. And it needs to be firm enough they can build on it in the future. So in that sense, I have no belief that they're spending exorbitant amounts of money that they could save otherwise. They also, if you go back to their presentations, the storms are not way off in the future. They could happen at any time. Sandy was nothing. As they said, it doesn't come close because it was a very simple storm in many ways. Once people lose their homes and I had to change insurance companies because they wouldn't, State Farm won't insure in my zip code anymore. So Nick is right that it's going to get harder and harder for people to insure. So whether it's your building owner or whether you're a condo owner, you're going to find it harder and harder to find insurance for your property if something isn't done. So I, I very much agree the project needs to move forward. Delaying it will only add more and more cost to it. So it's not the savings that people seem to be implying. Uh, a look at any project that's delayed will show that that never happens, that prices stay the same. They don't, unfortunately. Thank you, Betty. Thank you for sharing that. 
Um, I, ca I can't ba manage to balance between the chat and the hand raises and everybody else. Is there someone who hasn't spoken? I see nobody in the attendees. Bob Schneck, is your hand still raised? Yes. Okay, Bob. I just just wanted to comment that um, uh, just in response to Nick, I think that you know uh, the it is true that there's been a tremendous amount of of planning and thinking about this for a long time, and I I always have been a little overwhelmed by the scale of it, and even the if we actually saw the design budget for it, it would be very very considerable. But I could live with it until we hit this COVID period and I got to actually, I, I lived through every major disaster that we've had in lower Manhattan. And this is going to be the doozy of the whole bunch of them because it's going to include a depression like economic collapse. And so this, um, I always really prefer uh, practicality and simplicity as opposed to grandeur, I think that if 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 Betty carefully looks at the plan and looks at the way it's designed around the Jewish Museum and kind of in the yardage between the Jewish Museum uh, toward that hill and between the hill and Battery Park City, it is not as expensive as building a castle on top of building a mountain a mound first and then a castle on top of it. And so, if I were going to spend big money, I would spend it on excellent engineering to do something simple that's repeatable for something they were like the state or city of New York. The next thing is in terms of, of bond money and saving people, I myself haven't been able to uh, get a, to get um, kind of home equity loans for the past two years because of the leasehold problem we have here. And I've always had problem also with the, um, with the um, resiliency part, but it, we're able still to buy that kind of insurance. Those are really big issues, but but I think we've spent a very long time figuring out what we're doing with with this little piece of land. That's a, a little a little a little uh, nail par pairing of the edge of Manhattan, and spending tremendous amounts of money on it. So the amount of of money per yard that we're spending here is more than almost anywhere else on else on earth can. So I I think one one thing is rather than talking about what what kind of finishes we should have, whether we need more stairs here and there, where or not where trash containers should be, and all those things. Those things are really refinements of of big refined plans. They aren't about down and dirty kind of the, the the kind of solutions that are between pure A and the battery are fairly simple ones. Whether I like them or not, they're fairly simple and we don't even know how expensive those are and they've taken years to buy those parts. And it's just, I think that what we have here is, is something that started with a, with a, with with the controversy over whether or not we needed another restaurant in that park in the first place. And it's expanded to this as it expand is it expanded into resiliency. So uh, I I really again think that there's some real questions, especially given the time. Bob. Anybody else want to speak on this topic? I don't know if you can read. I'm looking to see about raised hands. Looking to see. Uh, Justine, I, I. And Lucian, your hand was raised, right? I'm sorry. <laughs> no, 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 no problem. I, I was just um, chiming in to say that Nick had, right before the meeting, he had sent me a video and he was mentioning it. Oh, yes, please. Do you want me to play that? Yes, please. That's okay. only fair. Um, Nick, just a question. The um, the video, there's two that you sent, non-alignment or aligned? Yes, thank you so much, uh, Jeff, by the way. If you don't mind, and they're both, again, they're really short. I would play the first one first, which is no alignment. Okay. Okay. And what this shows is if, if nothing is built in Wagner Park, 
So if we don't do anything, as, as some people are proposing here, um, what happens when we get hit with a 20, 50, 100 year storm? Again, Nick, um, just, as you're going to play this, I'm not no saying one... don't do anything. I'm saying put up, whether they're tiger barriers, put up something temporary that's cheap now. Right. I, I get it. I, I and get just hold off thing, on it. Tiger barriers are not going to. Tiger, tiger barriers are not going to do it, Christine. It's just not going to work. Tiger barriers are fine as far as they go, but then what happens to all the subsurface infrastructure? We no, no, I want you to do about? that. What you're, you're missing the, the point. Drainage? Right, it, that's it, not without All that that's has not to without happen. Cost. All that has to happen, totally, and that has to happen now. What doesn't have to happen is the rebuilding of the, of the knocking down a building and doing something else, because I totally agree with you. I am not, I'm trying to say save money where you can. Go ahead, play the video. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, I'm just on the phone, so you let me know when it's done. It's about a minute and so it's say maybe a minute, 17 seconds. Yeah, you'll see a couple of ways of attenuation, and then you'll see the, you'll see the big one that hit. Yeah, it's um, going now. Nick, while this is playing, uh, what's the difference? Whoops, I want the next video to play. Um, what's the difference between alignment okay. and alignment videos? Okay, so that was the first one. You all saw the, you all kind of saw the very sobering flooding of most of Lower Manhattan. Right. Um, the, the second link now, what that demonstrates, Chef, and thank you very much for driving. What the second link demonstrates is that modeling updated now with the South Battery Park City Resiliency Project alignment. So the same project we've been talking about, with that alignment in place, it shows you the level of protection it provides Battery Park City and Bath Swap World and including everyone's home, everyone's mm -hmm. business that's on the dry side of the battery. So if you play that, that's I think one minute and 15 seconds, mm -hmm. it shows you exactly what it is we're building and the tremendous benefit it brings. Nick, um, just one question. Is, is this showing? Is this just with the South Battery Park City improvements, or is this with the complete, but with an emphasis, a focus on that area? Oh, okay. It's the South project because you'll see it zoomed in just to that portion of the, the Battery Park City map. Um, we would presumably have updated versions of these once we do the north, but you'll see it's just limited to that area of from this just Dusso's Museum around Wagner, Pure, and the Battery. Okay, that's but it's assumes that all the other improvements have been put into place as well. Or is that... said, yes, it's, it's, it's the full South Valley Park City Agency project with all its component parts. So it's the Wagner Park portion, the PRA portion, uh, the battery portion. Okay. It won't take into account what happens in the West or the North because it's not going to show us that. But I guess if what shown, in there... yeah, the, no, yeah, the, the map is only yeah, the, the map is only zoomed, it's zoomed in close enough, but you're only seeing the southern part of the name. You're okay. Seeing, basically, from the Museum of Jewish Heritage to um, Battery Park. Okay, I just want to get the context right. Okay, I'm going to play now. Yeah. And that's the same wave attenuation. That's a 30, 30 inches of sea level rise by 2050, 100 years storm of that hit. Which okay, we've now we're approaching the storm surge. Yeah, now the big and one. And you'll see the protection. So what this is showing is that everything is flooding up. I mean, it, it's being prevented to where your barrier is. Oh, I see. Yeah, see, see, Lucian. Okay, it does. It does go into North Battery Park City because we haven't. That doesn't count for that. That okay. doesn't come south. Right. Right. 
and it protects. I'm saying do that. Just don't do it by doing the building quite yet. That's all. Nick, do you have a rendering of what it would look like if you managed to do the Western resiliency with temporary measures in the battery? I mean, taking care of puree, obviously, because that's the low yeah. point, but focusing on from the Jewish Heritage Museum North and what that would look like? I don't see him. I wonder if we lost him again. No, I mean, certainly it's, it's a very impactful video. It's a very impactful story. But once again, I don't think, I mean, and Tammy, please speak in, speak up because I know you have an opinion on this. Um, I don't think that anybody is saying don't do anything. No, I think we're all saying we all want resiliency. We want to protect all of Manhattan all the way around. That's clear. But I'm curious about the costs on for the west side, which is the last project to be done. And yet we need the park right now for social distancing. And we need people to be able to have shelter in their homes. So I would hope that we could find a way to stage these projects so the west side could take precedence and we could maintain the park for a couple of years while the west side is done because the west side didn't flood precipitously. But, you know, do puree because obviously we all know that needs. So I just let, want to make a comment on viewing those two um, disasters and that is that the disaster didn't penetrate the space between the uh, Jewish Museum and the center of Wagner Park and it didn't penetrate the space between uh, the Battery Park and the center of uh, of the Wagner Park. So those spaces that were that did not have that huge uh, that huge um, slug of of uh, dirt mountain there mm -hmm. uh, held just fine. And if you in fact had the same barrier that connected the battery park to the Jewish Museum it, that goes in front of that uh, of that hill and then scraped away the hill and had the same picture have the same uh, kind of demonstration happen, the same those same protections would, I hope, hold the same way without having to make all these decisions about refined changes. It's Which, possible, you know, yeah. Whether or not we have, uh, you know, how ramps work and how, how much we spend on gardens and how much we spend destroying the gardens we love already. Thank you, Bob. I mean, that would be an interesting conversation to have and an interesting um, information to gather because it may be insanely expensive and maybe just as expensive or close to it and we may turn around and say that's insane no just do what you're planning to do but it'd be nice to know what the options are and i know that this is something that we've always been pushing on and pushing on nick and, and eric but um it's an important thing especially because covid changed the whole game um i i don't i think marianne marianne braverman has a question in the chat saying could we get data about what buildings are experiencing as far as collecting maintenance on time, are owners defaulting on mortgages, are rental units empty? What is the real impact, I'm assuming you mean of COVID, on DPC owners and residents? I don't know that that's a, um, a uh, BPCA question, and I don't know, I think that's a board of each building question, and I don't imagine Bob Zach would be answering those questions, but I can ask him. I don't know if he's there still. Maybe unmute him. Bob, you're unmuted. He may not be there. And I, I'm pretty sure he probably could not answer. And whatever. But that's a that's a question, Marianne, that we could talk about offline. Um anybody else? Just if I I don't know if he can answer. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Somebody said Justine, who's that? Oh, that was Eric Bunsen. 
Eric, go ahead. Sorry. Hey, I, uh, not to the the most recent point, but I, I did just want to emphasize the fact that um, you know you're, the the conversation that's being had right now. Um, you know, isn't falling on deaf ears, and I'll I'll discuss it with the rest of the the team. Um, and also, just wanted to emphasize, you know, the the mandate that we have from our board is to get these projects done as quickly as possible. And um, you know, the ball fields and the South Resiliency Project came first, and so those are the ones that we've been pushing on as hard as we can to get them done as quickly. You know, we've been hesitant to pause any project, you know, with the exception, of course, of the governor's COVID related pause. Um, but, you know, the, the, the mandate remains to try to provide the protection for the community as quickly as we can um, and at the greatest value that we can. And so, you know, to Nick's point, um, you know, the, um, the economic conditions are, are clearly on a worsening trajectory um, at the same time between sea level rise and climate change and the increased frequency of um, severe weather events, um, you know, the, the meteorological trajectory is also worsening. And so we're trying to get all these projects done as quickly as we can and as cost efficiently as we can. And so I, I hear Bob's point that, you know, when we, we spend a lot of time talking about the nitty gritty details that you know, there's a risk of losing the forest through the trees, but, you know, I, I want you all to know that the, the forest isn't lost on us. And I don't think that it's, you know, it's not lost on anyone uh, who's working on the individual projects or, um, you know, at the board level or at senior staff level. Um, and, you know, we're focused on getting these projects done as quickly as we can for as little money as we can. And t again, to Nick's point, you know, we heard loud and clear that you folks, you know, wanted a uh, a replacement for the Wagner Park Pavilion. We didn't want to put a wall up in front of the pavilion and given the needs of the alignment, we needed to, um, you know, to address the, um, the, the pavilion in, in some form or fashion. And so, you know, AECOM I think has done a terrific job in large part thanks to your input and the input of the, the community board, all the committees, um, but particularly yours. And so again, we're, we're cautious and conscious of the, the impact that these discussions have had. And we're, you know, we're watching the dollars closely. But I, again, I just wanted to emphasize the fact that, um, you know, the, the conversation is, is heard and it'll be reported to the rest of the team. Thank you. Um, and in the sake of time, it's already 824. So I want to move on to the next topic, please, um, which is applicability of recent changes to city and state law on e-scooters and e-bikes in Battery Park City. And this will be a discussion. And um, in case anybody, you, you're not aware, uh, Lucian, I don't know if you have, have reference to the law, but what has happened is that uh, the city and the state say saying e-scooters are, um, you, you, that's not that, okay. Um, e-scooters are, um, they're talking about having them be allowed to be on the roads. Am I correct? Here we go. Yeah. So the state law that was passed uh, in the budget session this year um, essentially created a, a, a legal pathway to e-scooters and e-bikes in New York City. Um, mm -hmm. they, were, they were largely legalized in the rest of the state, but um, for some cases, the local municipalities, if they weren't, if they weren't legalized, local municipalities could um, choose to do so. And so um, very recently, um, that is what the New York City Council has done. So there was three bills um, that were, were uh, voted through City Council, um, one dealing with e-scooters, one dealing with a, a certain class of e-bikes, that is e-bikes e that go between uh, 20 and 25 miles per hour that have a throttle. Um, and um, the third bill was to authorize a scooter sharing pilot program to be developed by DOT. So um, I think the the relevant portion of this um, is can everyone see the um, the text of this bill INT 1250A? Um, that is where can these scooters um, be operated? So I think some of the uh, concern is that they there may be 
people out there who wish to operate them outside of uh, uh, the street. Excuse me. Yeah. Um, so the part of this I was looking through earlier, Tammy asked me to read through this law and um, there's a section in here. Uh, here we go. Uh, part B here. No person shall operate a motorized scooter on streets or in parks or another. Per okay, let's see. Let me make sure. Isn't it in the top seems, part? It seems like not the right section. I was scanning through no. it, so. Um, no person shall operate a motor scooter on streets or parks or in public places in the city of New York. I have to go, I have to go back through this because this is operates the bicycles pursuant to the vehicle traffic law. Um, the, it's saying you can't do it in the parks and then um, same rights and responsibilities as operators of bikes. Yeah, but the part here that kind of confuses me is on streets or in parks. So yeah, it only leads to sidewalks. <laughs> that seems crazy. Yeah, versus parks. Yeah, so. I, I know that that's not that's not the intent of this is to put them on sidewalks because they're they're very large. Um, mm -hmm. I'll have to go back through, but because uh, yeah, they're not talking about like what Betty rides. No, these are well, these are scooters. These are akin to um, the scooters you see children kind of pushing, but yeah. they're, they're much larger and and they're electric. Yeah, they're electric, and, and 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 the motorized bikes too. I thought they were going. So this parts. is the part that this is the part that really matters is the operation of electric scooters. Uh, vehicle traffic law will be subject to the same rights and responsibilities attributed to operators of bicycles pursuant to the vehicle and traffic law. This code and the rules of the department shall be subject to any additional applicable provisions of the vehicle traffic law. So um, this is saying that they can be operated under the same rules as bikes, meaning they can't be taken on limited access highways. Uh, they can't be uh, operated on the sidewalk. Um, I just need to look and find specifically I got a, it says motorized scooter shall not include an electric scooter as defined in 114E. Uh, I see. So yeah, so this is saying a motorized scooter like like a gasoline or something powered. Right, right, right. Like some simple motor, but this is the electric scooter. So um, it looks like where bikes are permitted in parks, scooters will also be permitted in parks, but where bicycles are prohibited, so shall a bicycle is what my read is on this, but I am not a lawyer. Um, now, let me also pull up. You put in a resolution? No, I, I was just doing oh, okay. up the other law. Give me one second. I'm going to bring up the other law. Uh, chat with everyone. I hear a good Cora is helping us out here, too. Yeah, Cora. Feel free to chime in. The Cora is saying here from the City Council City Council votes to legalize the use of e bikes and scooters. Sorry, I'm opening it up. Maybe it's the same thing that you got. It's legislature is going to remove restrictions on three classes of electric bikes with top speeds under 25 miles per hour and electric scooters with top speeds under 20 miles per hour. E-bikes and e-scooters were legalized statewide when the state budget was passed on April 1st. Um, the council is now acting to remove the local law that prohibits them and adds measures to ensure, designed to ensure that delivery cyclists are not subject, subject to unequal crackdowns and summonses on their bikes, of their bikes, by the New York City Police Department. So they're basically trying to give them more free reign to go. Uh, allows restaurants to temporarily use, okay, outdoor space in front of their business, we know that. Let's go ahead. And it eliminates the prohibition so on collective more, It's just the same one that I just did. So it's, it's it looks like it's the one about e-bikes, but. E-bikes and then the same thing well, as we the, Generally what this does is it allows, it, it, it legalizes the use of e-bikes. What this doesn't do, and it, the, the New York City Council could do this per the state law, is what this doesn't do is uh, allow for 
currently prohibited e-bike classes on Hudson River Park. It does not allow or it, it does? does? Not. Those, the bikes that were prohibited by state law remain prohibited. New York City Council has the power to allow them to do so, but none of the bills that were that were discussed or voted on do that. All they did was they allowed for the class of e-bike that is very typically employed in the delivery of food and and sometimes groceries. Excuse me, this is Betty. May I please yeah. suggest that we limit only to Battery Park City? The Transportation Committee is doing this anyway. This yes. Topic. Uh, so if you'd limit it to just Battery Park City. Yeah. yeah. So I, and talking about our parklands is what I want to focus it on. And, yeah, and so, we need a. Sorry, go ahead. So the applicability of that when applied to Battery Park City is to, I don't know what degree when they say the Hudson River Park, you know, in the, in the state law, I have to read the state law in, in their description of the state park along the Hudson, if that includes Battery Park City Parks, which is, it's a state authorities park, but it is not, it's, it's not synonymous with state parks in the same way. So I would have to ask Eric or Nick to comment on whether that, whether or not e-bikes were, even though they're currently against the rules to go on the greenway in battery park city if that state law applies to the parks within battery park city and then all of a sudden makes them allowable is that your point but, but what i'm saying is if the state law prohibits it and hudson river hudson river park if it also prohibited it in battery park city because then it would still there would still need to be legislation battery park city authority couldn't even allow it without city legislation if that's the case, I believe. That's only if Battery Park City Park, Authority Parks are, are what's understood to be meant by what was described in the state law. So, so to, your question to them is what? Your, to Eric and Nick, I'm not clear. Lucian, so, Cora. A, yes, okay. Cora. It's not chiming. I thought Como passed the law, the state. Yeah. It was April 1st that they passed the law. So it's legal at the state level. And yeah. then at that time, the city, the council hasn't passed that law. Mm -hmm. the state, then the state. the state law passed. It was legal at the state level. Mm -hmm. Then the city council on June 25th, that Thursday, they passed a number of bills. And this is one of them. And yeah. the reason why Como passed the law, part of it is also because of COVID and all these delivery guys become our heroes delivering food, right? So I thought it was legal at the state, then now it's legal at the city. Mm. But with the Hudson River Park Trust, Bob Townley can give you a very good synopsis of the whole thing because they almost spend, I think, a year of time every time when the Hudson River Park Trust Advisory Council is a community groups of many, many from the bottom all the way up in the north, all the com um, all the organizations, including Boathouse, we have a little part of it discuss they do not want e bikes on the Greenway. So that Hudson River Park Trust is a very particular segment, but the leadership with, at that advisory council made it very clear. They've been discussing it. They, they do not want e-bikes or scooters or anything. But then every park city just ended, I'm not sure it was the official line, but it sort of ended by Stuyvesant High, right? Yeah. So then we need BPC to clarify. That's right. Or where. Got it. Mm -hmm. State law gave cities the ability to Check. legalize e-bikes and e-scooters, which mm -hmm. the city council has done. They also, that law also gave, I believe, gives the city the ability, if it wishes, to legalize the use of the Hudson River Greenway within Hudson River Park for the same purpose, though city council did not do that here. So that would still be prohibited use along the Greenway. 
along the it's, greenway. Yes. yes. But I, <laughs> what I, I'd like to clarify is. It was a language specific to just the Hudson River Park Greenway, or was it state parks along the Hudson River? In which case, maybe Battery Park City falls in. That's what I'm unclear on. Who, who are you asking that of? Either Sparrow? Eric or Nick. Eric or Nick. So Eric or Nick, can you answer that? Okay. Yeah, I'm here. Can you can you hear me? Yes. This is Nick Sportnum. Yes. Um, thanks, Lucian. That's actually really helpful. So, from a very practical perspective, and I say practical because. As much as we live and breathe, kind of local government, the, the regular lay person on the street doesn't care or know a whiff of difference between when Battery Park City starts versus Hudson River Park starts versus the East River versus their, its place to ride is a place to ride. So I think it's fair to say that Battery Park City has no interest in being a separate entity in this respect on whether bike can be legal or not, right? So we are part of New York City. If they are legal on uh, illegal in New York City in certain areas, we want that that same model, I think, to apply to Battery Park City. As I understand, you can't ride them on sidewalks. Mm -hmm. That would be the same kind of approach in, in Battery Park City. Um, the Esplanade is mapped parkland, and Lucian makes a good point in that we are a, we're a state entity with parks, but we're not a state park per se. I'm not sure, though, from a from a legal perspective, whether that's a distinction, whether that's a difference, I don't know. I guess what I'm trying to say is we wouldn't want um, we wouldn't want to get into the business of trying to kind of check every bike that comes into into Battery Park City and say, well, you're in Battery Park City now with a different set of rules. We want it to be obviously a consistent set of rules across um, you know across low Manhattan certainly. Um, ultimately, it will come down to enforcement. If right now the rule is bicycles that are regular human powered bicycles, non motorized scooters, uh, are allowed on the Esplanade, but we have a dismount zone in and around the marina, especially because it's such a heavily crowded area. The good news is, is for delivery purposes, I'm not aware of any building in Battery Park City that has an entrance on the Esplanade, especially down around South Cove, building. Purposely don't open on the Esplanade. They open on the front. They open on, yeah. uh, on South End Avenue or on Battery Place. So there wouldn't be a need for a delivery worker to ride down the Esplanade unless they were just looking to ride down the Esplanade or they didn't know the difference. I think in most cases they'd be going right through the doors, the building's entrance, which is not on the Esplanade uh, and not on the sidewalk except for the, the distance that you're getting from the street into the building. So I think that covers us for. Sidewalks and lift them out for delivery workers. For people who are not delivery workers who are riding these things, although I think what Lucian said is this, this bill was specifically aimed at delivery workers, or at least mostly aimed at them. It's probably going to take a little more research to understand how we fit in, but I think the general thrust is um, we are part of New York City and want to make sure that we're coordinating with city and state DOTs, certainly on uh, on how that manifests itself. But in as much as the Esplanade is park plan, and these things are not to be written in parks. I think we may be covered, but again, I'm not an attorney and have to research it all. Thank you, Nick. That's helpful, and I appreciate you looking into it. But I want to remind you that PJ Clark's the district and everything in, in Brookfield and, and even Gigino's in Wagner Park, they all will require access on the park or into the park. So you're going to have people riding perhaps on the even delivery people. And I think that back in 20, February 26, 2019, Battery Park City Committee, we passed a uh, motorized vehicles in Battery Park City parklands, and we passed mm -hmm. a, we passed a resolution asking that um, CB1 requests the BPCA and Battery Park City Car Parks Corporation define the rules to explicitly disallow powered bicycles, scooters, and any matter of recreational micro mobility devices to be driven through the parks within its jurisdiction on anything apart from human power. And of course, we're not talking about um, scooters for handicapped people or, you know, obviously bicycles for children, whatever else. But um, the request does not include motorized devices that are used by individuals of limited mobility as an accommodation, blah, blah, blah. So I guess glad to hear you saying you want to do what the Hudson River Park Trust is doing. Glad to hear Cora say that Bob Townley is, is um, on the case to try to keep the e-scooters e and e-bikes off the uh, greenway. But I think that from my perspective, I'd like us to remind you of, of the 
resolution back in 2019 in February and to say uh, we'd like the Battery Park City Authority to, to push to have them off the uh, Esplanade at all parts because we do have businesses that are there. We may not have businesses, uh, condos that open up, but we have businesses that are there. And then if there is some sort of a limitation, what is the BPC Parks doing about signage? If you're looking at like by Chamber Street and Wagner. So I just throw that out to you guys. And here you go. Um, thank okay. you. And then I'm loving the fact the Transportation Committee is picking this up because it, it is a much bigger problem than what we have just in Battery Park City, obviously. Yeah, it's um, it is it's it's it's, it's a significant problem. So I'm glad that transportation is devoting some time to this as well. Just very briefly, just you know, take those in, in turn or in reverse. So, um, I guess keep hearing about uh, wayfinding. We did the presentation, I think, I said a month ago or so, but that signs will be appearing, um, in our parks hopefully, uh, soon, and we would um, in in, in as much as it's it's modular or you know kind of. It, it, it can be easily changed in a way that's not cheap, but you know, easily changed, or it's not like this course of signage. We'd be able to adapt that, um, presumably, to account for any changes that are made. The second point I would make is, I do note the resolution from the committee. Um, we appreciate it. I think here, it's it's probably a fundamental difference now because in the past, before the new law was passed, these were illegal anyway. So presumably, Battery Park City Authority could amend its rules to match whatever the state law is. But now, since that has changed at a state level where they are legal, um, the Battery Park City Authority is not going to go. Couldn't we couldn't go against state law? We can all we can go above what it allows, but we couldn't be in conflict with it. So it's illegal in the state. They have to be legal here. We have to define and understand kind of how that applies. But what I'm saying is it's not going to be a place where they're legal everywhere, but they're not legal in, in Battery Park City. It doesn't work that way. We can't go opposite or in the, we can't go opposite or in conflict to what city and state law says. So I think then it's important for some representatives from the Battery Park City Committee to come to the Transportation Committee meeting so we can talk about it in more depth. Because I know the t that yeah, uh, I'd like to Betty goes into too, great I wanna, detail. I want to get, get some more clarity on it. I, I think yeah. that would be really helpful. Me too. And so I'm looking forward to Betty and the Transportation Committee. So Next. thank you. Nick, do Nick. all park rules in Battery Park City exist exactly the same as they are in all other state parks? It's a good question. I haven't done a line by line. I haven't done a line by line comparison. I probably need an attorney or do you or two to look at it. I think that hey, this is Eric. This is Eric Munson. Can I just ask a quick question? Uh, setting aside the, the important legal considerations, could I just ask the, the committee? I recognize that the Greenway is sort of a, a thoroughfare uh, for a lot of cyclists, but are there other areas that are of grave concern as it pertains to motorized um, bikes? Because in, independent of what the regulations are, I think it's something that we would want to sort of have our eye on because, you know, the, whether it's permitted or not, if somebody is creating an unsafe condition in our parks, it's something that we would want to address, um, you know, and Pat's on the line as well. And so we can address those items just as a, you know, sort of human to human perspective. The, the es all parts of the Esplanade are a concern. Yes. For any, but I guess for the motorized. It, it's just, there are some delivery um, guys who do whip through on the Esplanade yep. it, because it's faster during the evening times, but it's very dangerous. I haven't seen that when I've been walking the Esplanade, but that's good. That's good to know. So something to that that we yeah. should be concerned about. Thank you. And, and the parks guys can't catch them because they're too fast. Yeah, no, they just go. So it's not. Yeah. It's not. Okay. All right. So um, Betty, Bob, Cora, and then we're going to wrap this up. So Betty first, please. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, I you know what I'm realizing. There are people and have been actually for a couple of years, people who use e-bikes and e-scooters in Battery Park City, because uh, I see them all the time. Oh, yeah. There's some children who commute to and back from school and back on e-scooters, because I see them at the hours. That's obviously where they're coming from or going to. So I don't think they're as huge a problem as people are alluding to the fact that they are. 
But again, there are some real fine points because when you have joggers and people running, when you have people who can cycle quickly, the real issue is how fast are people going? It's not that any one particular method is more dangerous than the others. Uh, and I think that needs to really be looked at so you can be fair all around. Someone who is careless and crashing into people is doing exactly that. And you won't really care what they're using if they crash into you. Yeah, very good point, Betty. All right. That's a good point. Bob, do you have something to say, Bob Schneck? Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to say that the the class of these um, kinds of vehicles is a very complex thing. And, and um, I think we have segways now, we have electric unicycles. I think one of the scariest ones from my point of view uh, is the motorized skateboard. <laughs> I think yeah. those things are extremely fast. They operate uh, pretty near everywhere. And they actually uh, go as fast as a car, but they have wheels that are about uh, about two inches high. And those, having operated motorcycles for many hundreds of thousands of miles, uh, when you go into a pothole and when you operate them at night, you can't you can't see them. And something like a pothole is is enough to stop these things. So I think that the general operation of that are, are suddenly allowable, are dangerous, and um, and that I feel commonly at risk because I can't hear them. They don't have any. There's no way for them to make sounds. I've never heard any any person operating these things ever say. With bicycles, typically people say, "Go to your left," or they'll have a little sound thing. These things don't have any way to warn anyone. And and what we've done is we've completely done away with the difference between operating a motor vehicle and just allowing this laissez-faire thing. I operated motorcycles for years and you have to follow the rules. You stop at the light, you kind of make a right turn where you're supposed to make a right turn. You wouldn't think of going up a one-way street, but all of these motorized vehicles, regardless like of what the laws are, uh, you can't, when, when I'm crossing the street, I can't tell if something's coming Coming, to, I look to the right because it's a one-way street down the hill, but someone's coming up the hill, or several of them are coming up the hill. So I think these are. I think that there, uh, it's a very complex question, and these guys operating on these one-wheeled vehicles that also get up to thirty miles an hour, they're kind of dangerous. And also, we are going to have to start to think about how to provide secure uh, micro bike and bike storage because. Uh, having operated bicycles uh, for years in New York too, people tend to steal them or steal parts off them. And so yeah. we have, as we kind of bulk up with m more people operating more kinds of scooters, a real question is where do you put them so someone can't steal them? And you know how, uh, you know how do you keep that from being protected yet? reasonable looking and not become kind of a trash heap of broken parts until I don't know I, I so often see a a bicycle over weeks stripped down to the bone until you still have, you just have this little frame that's still locked to a a, a a parking meter or something these things have are I think big upcoming problems besides the dangers of them so I don't know what what I I can I certainly think that there are problems on the Esplanade and on the Greenway, and I think there are broader problems than that even in Battery Park City. Thank you, thank you for sharing that, Bob. Um, and yeah, as, uh, what is this? Our resolution. Yes. Yeah, so I'm going to comment would be at this point to ask if um, sorry. Give me a second. Go away. I'm so sorry. What I would ask is for um, for Nick and for and for Eric to just get back to us and let us know where, where the um, Esplanade in Battery Park City falls in under what their understanding is of the rules, and if it's possible to make it a park rule to keep them off in compliance in 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 conjunction and in, in accord with what we've asked you to ask to be done. 
back in February 2019 to make it a park rule to keep them off of it. But we got eight minutes till nine o'clock. Can we finish, Nick, your report and Patrick's in eight minutes? Is that possible? I am loaded for bear. I am ready to go. Thank you. Go ahead. All right. Okay. Um, I like Lucian. that sign. That do you have a uh, Do you have the report you're, up? Yeah, you're up. Your report's up. And on screen, Nick. You just tell me where to where to scroll. All right. Very good. So let me bring it up here. First of all, thanks everyone. Um, so the first things first is I wanted to go through as promised with the committee, which we said we would do last week, come back with uh, updates on the reopening of Battery Park City and its various facilities. So um, thank you all for that at the outset. You'll see I have some information up top um, about uh, statewide openings, but very briefly for us and for the committee, I think that we began reopening um, in the middle of June, as promised. So the first thing we did on um, June 15th, June 16th in that area was uh, we opened up the restrooms. Now, what we discussed last meeting was potentially having them opened up um, from 8.30, uh, from 8.30 and then scaling up, which we were able to do. So we, we opened them up on the 16th. Uh, from 8.30 to 3.30, and then we were able to fairly quickly thereafter, thanks to Bruno and the entire great parks operation team, we were able to open them up fairly thereafter and extend the hours out to 8.30. PM? That's uh, wonderful, we were, Nick. Thank you. 8.30. I'm sorry. No, I'm, I'm oh. lying. Hold on a second. Sorry. I'm trying to bring up my, my, my report. On Nick, do we go to the next slide? Do you have it written out in the next no. slide? Yeah, it's, it's it's the second slide. Sorry about that. I'm trying to download this here. It's 9.30, it's 6.30. My mistake. <laughs> it's been a long day. It was 8, 3.30 at first, and then we were able to extend the hours out to 8 uh, to, to 6.30. That's still a plus. Thank you. Um, right. So that's that's the three hours more, and we were able to get that. I have it up here. That's not the second page. My mistake. Apologies. Okay. Um, then what we were able to do the same thing, Rockefeller Handball Court, we put some signage there to be clear that we wanted to make sure we open that for folks to use, but very clear that it was for single slash solitary recreational use only because in as much as contact sports really still shouldn't be happening to any great degree, mm -hmm. we want to be mindful of that. But we're also giving, again, people some additional extra space to, to get some exercise. Okay, dog runs, which I know is a very hot topic of interest. I called Jeff Galloway that very day personally, mm -hmm. so let him know I had some good news. But Thank we you. were able to reopen those, of course. Thank you guys for the patience while we while we bear while we bear our way through this. Those reopened on June twenty second. We originally had thought that we might try and scale those up similarly to what we did with the restrooms, but after talking it over with the team and operationally we decided um, and with what the community had told us, we decided we were just gonna open those up outright. So they now are back open up as they regularly are with around the clock availability. Um, we're asking owners, obviously, to continue to be diligent on the overnight and evening hours um, as we continue to scale up with staff. So they'll still be clean all once daily, but we wanna make sure that we are trying to keep them to the same standards that everyone is used to as we continue to scale up staff and are able to clean them more frequently as needed. Nick, um, quick, the quick water, question. Go ahead. Nice, uh, quick question, Miriam Braverman saying that she did not know about the park public restrooms being opened as of June 16th. Was it, is it on your website or, you know, more real time? Okay, it is. It is. All right. If you go to, uh, yeah, it's the blog post there. I think I put it out last time. I tweeted about it as well, but yeah. Um, in the report that I'm going to post, Lucian, if you actually want to click on that link in the report, it's, it's a live link. So if you click on restrooms, you'll see the blog, the blog post there. With an update, that as of the 25th, the hours were extended to six thirty. So sorry about that, Mary. But yes, it's, it's all there. Thank um, you. Of course, the dog runs opened up, like I said, and what we opened up also reactivated when they opened up was the hose um, and the drinking fountain for the pups to use, obviously, so the pups can get some refreshment and folks can use the hose to clean it. Um, and then what we scaled up just recently as of yesterday, I believe it was, we reactivated the water features in those parks as well. So kind of the water play areas for the dogs as well were reactivated in 
serious dog run and north end. West Thames dog run is not having uh, water play features. But the water play features is serious and that um, north end were activated yesterday. Thank you. Okay. Of course. Playgrounds were reopened as of last Monday, June 22nd. That was uh, aligned with when the city of New York parks were opening or reopening their playgrounds, I should say. The yeah, hours there are dawn to dusk daily as the as um dawn to dusk daily as the as the handle quarters. Okay. Um, the water features there were reactivated yesterday like the water play features at the dog ones were. So water play features at the Kelsey Plaza and Teardrop Park playgrounds were reactivated yesterday. West Penn Street playground, as luck would have it, there's a, a bit of a technical issue, so we're going to have to order a new park to get that water play feature fixed. But aside from that, all the water play features are back on. Playgrounds, dog runs, Rockefeller Park, Handball Court, and the restrooms are reopened. Um, so thank you everyone for bearing with, with us on that. Very briefly, thank construction you. updates, of course, construction updates. Um, BPCA construction projects are now in the process of either physically restarting construction, i.e. at Rockefeller Park, you'll see some Rockefeller Park playground, I should say. We're doing some work there and are tracking ideally still for an early fall completion with any luck. Don't hold me to it. Any luck, maybe we come in a little bit earlier. But we are tracking hopefully for an early fall completion for our Tupelo Park playground. Fallfield Terrace League remediation is also restarted, uh, and we are remobilizing on some of our other projects, including the glass benches, which we have uh, been talking about for some time. Okay, very briefly, BPC Pride 2020, and thank you to the community board for helping spread the word as well. You saw it as a bench by uh, Esplanade Plaza and by Merchants Riverhouse, I should say, that is especially themed for Pride. There are also lights along the Esplanade especially themed for Pride right along that same area. So see some great pictures there of a-, yep. a It was very Maybe lovely. Just came. And the, Maybe and the just the dog run that was just really open. Who knows that there's a pup there and there's BJ and there's a great video, which I was gonna have Lucian play, but in the interest of time, I won't. It's on our YouTube and it's linked in this report as well, but it's a short little like 40 second video that shows the lights in action. So thank you all for the support. And it was, uh, as many things are these days, scaled back in the age of COVID, but certainly something we wanted to take a moment um, to recognize and be proud of. Um, blood Nick, drive. can I interrupt you a quick, a quick yeah. question if we can go back to the parks? So maybe Nick, uh, yeah. Lucian, go back a slide because I, I was trying to read as you were talking. So I saw- Yes, I'm sorry, um, go ahead. No, no, it's okay. I'm um, sorry. No, go to the parks one. We were doing the, the so I saw that you talked about- Page two. Um, that, no, yeah, okay. No, go back, one backwards. Sorry, no, one day. Uh, I, okay, I'm gonna get the parks all wrong. I didn't see West Thames Park to see if you were gonna open the walkway. Time. That's okay, I'm sorry. It's just slow. But I wanted oh, to- the West Thames, Oh, yes, yes, very good question. I'm so glad you brought that up because I specifically called EDC today and I have a call, I have a call okay, in them. I have a call sorry, in them you, about when it may start. <laughs> yeah, but no, no, it's Go okay. Ahead. I have a call to them about when it may start. You only call, Justine, I don't know if you were at that meeting, but, um, EDC and I think the mayor's office was going to be briefed the Environmental Protection Committee, I want to say, yeah. a month ago or so. On You remember that, right? When they talked about a lot of their projects now kind of being momentarily, quote unquote, paused because of COVID. As yes. I understand it, again, I don't want to speak to EDC, so please, I will, I will reach out to them and ask them to get you guys an update. But as I understand it, some of their projects are now slowly, but steadily coming back online. Mm -hmm. um, that presumably includes uh, the reconstruction of the West Penn's lawn uh, and that area, that sidewalk area between two, uh, 225 Rector and the, the walkway between 225 and the lawn. Um, so I will ask them to reach out to you directly with an update on, on when that might be completed or even maybe to come to you guys next month. I don't want to commit them to it, but I will ask them. That would be great if you can give us some timeline for that to get that open. Yeah, and, and then absolutely. I see, let's see, wait, so I saw something, I, I just, I can't see it on the screen here, but the water features on what, what what are our parks that we have now for the kids? The kids park is open uh, up the Thames. Is the water working? Plaza playground is on. Teardrop Teardrop Park playground is on. West Thames playground has an issue. We have to replace the park. That will be on. Uh, okay. TV, TV, and what about Rockefeller Park? I haven't been up. I'm, I'm 
Sad to say I haven't been running no, okay. that way lately. I don't know what's going on at Rockefeller Park. Well, yeah, Park. Well, Rockefeller, Rockefeller, Rockefeller Park is under construction anyway, so I'm not counting that in that way. And it's still I'm not, not been as well. Because it's, yeah, yeah. it's under construction generally. And there's no timeline on that opening yet, or is there? I mean, I know that um, it was on pause, so. Yeah, no, we're looking at that. Um, construction, again, has actually restarted there. Guys are on Friday. Oh, daily. The workers are on Friday, I should say. Oh, guys. Um, they're working, and we are hopefully shooting for early fall. So early fall, okay. With, with any luck, maybe a little earlier, but I don't want to commit to it. I'd rather tell you early fall, and maybe we be able to and exceed some expectations. Okay. But, uh, early fall. And the ball fields are open or not open? Ball fields are the last thing on my list. Actually, yes, I skipped over that. Sorry. Sorry, no. It's we good. had committed to you all last month that we would take it back based on the considerations uh, and the feedback you had given and, and kind of give some thought about how we might open them up. Um, I'm pleased to report now why they'll have a full detail on exactly how that reopening will happen. I can tell you that we're actively working on preparations to reopen the field in the coming days in accordance with uh, the recently issued state guidelines for sports and recreation. So what that means is, I don't have an exact date, but I would hope is that within the next, you know, few days or a week or so, we would have those fields um, back opened up and we want to try to make sure that we have as much as we can and it's an open, open play time for folks who aren't otherwise affiliated with the league. The leagues I'd imagine themselves are kind of starting to get back ramped up. And we want to try and make sure we're keeping those fields as accessible as we can for as many people as we can. So more details to come there, but um, we want to get those open as quickly as we can too. And that would obviously include the restrooms on the ball fields. Once the ball fields reopen, the restrooms would then reopen. Like the we'll reopen, that makes out. sense. Um, and then when you say the leagues, you're talking about the little kids, but leagues, right? Not the grown ups. Yeah, league. like downtown soccer, downtown yeah. Giants. Got it. Um, All right. Green, like that. All okay. right. Yep. It's 9.04. Um, it took right. longer. So let's go quick. I'm going fast. I'm going fast. DPC Blood Drives, thank you all so much. I'm going to embarrass her now, but she's on the phone this long, so she's going to get it. Tammy Meltzer showed up and donated blood. You'll see on page four, if you scroll down, there's a little kick stitch that I did. And in the upper right corner, sure enough, there's Tammy Meltzer and me wearing our masks, hmm. donating blood. I didn't donate. I just showed up. Tammy yeah. donated, so kudos to her. Okay, Deborah Glick also came by to show her support, help, uh, her support, help spread the word. So thank you, Assembly Member. Um, I'm pleased to report that through the two blood drives we've done so far. Last month, we announced we had one on June 8th. Since then, we booked another one on June 25th. Yes. It was almost 200 units collected over those two drives, 76 the first time and 106 that's Thursday. So Excellent. thank you to all our donors. Thank you to the BPC seniors, uh, Marianne and Anne for helping spread the word. Fran Dixon, who works with the group, has really kind of been instrumental in this. So thank you. It's been so successful. We're planning a part three on Thursday, July 23rd. Um, nice. That hyperlink is old. But as soon as I have a new hyperlink, I will share that with the group as well. If people want to make their appointment, they should do so now, and we want to try and continue to meet this need. So thank you to everyone who's donated. It's wonderful. All right. Thank you. And All right. Of course. So go ahead. Oh, oh, we're done. Yeah, we're having no, please tell me, no walk. Almost done, yes. <laughs> since, it's, since it's 2020, I'll continue to embarrass folks about it, but make sure okay. that you're doing it. I know you guys have on every month. As of yesterday, New York City is at 52.9% response rate. Against New York State, it's 57.3% and a 61.8% nationally. I looked at some of the other states. Alabama, it has a higher response rate than you guys, which means you want Alabama to get more resources, by all means, don't respond to the census. Nothing against Alabama, but make sure you're responding to the census. Wow. Okay. Virtual programming, some really, really fun programs on uh, commemoration of Juneteenth, which as you know, the governor uh, has uh, made a, a holiday for state workers this year and is proposing legislation to make it a statewide holiday. Kudos to you, Governor Cuomo, and everyone else. Thank you for that. Yep. To a field day was a big hit. People submitted videos of their own. The last thing I wanted to hit on very briefly, unless there are questions, is there was a note that I would know went across. Justine, you may have been on it, but I know Tammy and Lucian, I think, were the Hoboken Ferry uh, to Brookfield Place is now back in service beginning yesterday, beginning Monday, June 29th. All the bullets are there from the email that Donald Bobloy had sent. That Donald has come to the committee before. He's usually very responsive. Um, it's abbreviated, meaning it's not as many boats going, um, but it is still nonetheless running every 20 minutes from 6, 10 a.m. 
for about 7, 10 p.m. Monday to Friday. And, and, and they're using the quieter boats, the non-stinky boats, and whatever else it is that they're supposed oh, to be using. Oh, you know what? It's a good question. <laughs> I'm I waiting. Think, I, I believe so. I believe that was the plan once they had them all online. I'll confirm okay. with Donald. Um, yeah, but everyone should continue that. to know that they're taking all necessary precautions to uh, ensure that folks are staying in a safe distance, doing deep cleanings. They're, uh, they're, they're screening their own employees daily to make sure that no one's sick. So a lot of the same measures you're seeing employed elsewhere is happening there as well with um, okay. safety being uh, top priority. Resiliency we've, we've done to death tonight, but uh, thank you to Lucian and Candy for helping us try to identify a date, hopefully for the next North meeting, more to come there. We'll see what else has sustainability plan. Oh, very briefly. I know Bob Zach left a while ago, but one of the things I neglected to mention in my answer before was, as Eric had alluded to, we certainly hear you all on concerns about affordability. Generally, it's in our strategic plan, obviously, but it's not just words on paper. We have been actively meeting with uh, condo boards and with residential building managers on upcoming local 197 requirements. Um, Part of our sustainability plan will contemplate that, and part of the implementation plan, which uh, will soon be coming later this month, we would hope to be able to continue to work with buildings and help them identify resources as they are available, whether they are grants or other types of programs available through, for instance, NYSERDA or the New York State, uh, New York City Mayor's Office of Resiliency. There are grants and other types of um, inducements available to buildings. Um, to help them get more green. Battery Park City is lucky in that in the main, we are greener than other neighborhoods, but there are certainly within that pool buildings that are um, better off and, and not as, as well off. So we want to make sure that buildings are being connected to the resources that they need, and we are we are committed to that. Nick, um, thank you for that. That's a really important thing. And um, No, and I'm sorry, keep, I forgot to mention it before, up. but I, I, I want to yeah. make sure folks know that we, we feel it and we want to make sure that a part of having community is making sure that we have people who, who live here. That's just about beautiful buildings and, and beautiful resiliency about and the people who live here. We completely understand. Part of the conversation and me bringing up that whole discussion earlier is I want you guys to help think outside the box. And mm -hmm. I think that we want to do whatever support we can give to think outside the box to, to make this and to make it a sustainable as well as a beautiful community. But hurry up, it's 909. All right, Are that's you? it. Um, yeah. BBC Beautiful, thank you to our staff. Continue to do great work. Al Rife is one of our maintenance technicians, was recently featured with a downtown line, so thank you to them. Uh, and that's it. The rest of this you've seen. I'm obviously here for questions. Otherwise, I will segue at the bottom of page uh, 9 of my report, bottom of page 10, to Pat to go through some of the numbers. Yay, Pat. From thank West you for Chamber your patience. 15. And thank you, everyone. And it's Eric, could I just say, as, as Pat's gearing up, that, that the Allied team has really been tremendous throughout COVID-19. They've been showing up to work and doing a great job, not just with their normal duties, but also enforcing social distancing and some of those other elements that are so important to keeping our neighborhood safe. So wanted to publicly acknowledge him and his team for their, their important work these past few months. Thank you for that, Eric. I appreciate it. Uh, as you, everybody can see on on the chart, you know, uh, compared to 2019 and now for June, graffiti we only had two in 2019. 2020 we had seven. Uh, most of those were chalk, thankfully. Uh, the homeless situation in 2019 was 27. Uh, this year was 25. But uh, Does to that be mean honest. The question to be know. honest, to be honest, this year uh, we're seeing more and more of uh, emotionally disturbed homeless people on site. Pat, question for you. Sorry, question for you about homeless people. Is that 27 homeless people, or is it 27 um, interactions with because of the problem? Or, you know, or 27. It's 27 interactions with homeless people. Okay, thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, lost and found property uh, last year was 16. This year was six. Uh, park rules last year was 44. This year 37, which really a bit of a surprise on my part. Uh, vendor solicitation 24 last year, nine this year. Uh, we're basically dealing with the ice cream truck coming back. 
And uh, dogs, last year was 81, and this year we're at 68. So good trends almost all the way around, so that's nice. How right, the numbers, the numbers are all down pretty much except for graffiti. How are your allied people feeling with the with COVID, and have you heard any responses from them about people with masks, no masks, enforcement? Well, pretty pretty much, uh, thankfully, knock wood. Uh, my staff has been healthy, and uh, nobody, you know, either off duty, uh, was in contact. So that's good. Uh, basically, with the social distancing. Uh, people are pretty much adhering to it. Uh, the mass, when they're outside in the park and they're with their group, they feel um, a good number of them that because they're over six feet away, they don't have to wear a mask. So that's the pushback. And uh, that's pretty much anyway on what the rule is. If you're six feet away, you know, and you're with your own group, you don't have to wear it. So uh, that's that's the way it's been. Really, we haven't seen the park, in all honesty, overcrowded until the weekend. The weekend is where we're seeing uh, more people out on the lawns, and it, you know, and using the playground facilities, which is nice because now they're open. Question for right. you: Smoking. Um, I was seeing this morning. I think it was on the neighborhood chat that people were complaining, or at least one person was complaining about people smoking on the Esplanade, and they're not supposed to. Is that correct? That's correct. That's we, correct. Have one person, we have one person that comes out smoking a cigar, but uh, really the smoking issue, uh, let me see, the smoking issue pretty much also has gone down. Uh, like I said, we had one or two cigar smokers that came out during the uh, pandemic. And uh, they're slowly getting discouraged right now from smoking. Okay. Um, like I said, I noticed, well, I noticed, I personally didn't notice it, but I did notice that people were talking about groups of people as well. So that would be something maybe to ask your folks about just to kind of keep an eye out and remind sure. people gently that they're not supposed to be smoking out there. Because it's with with the public space being limited as it is and crowds and you're trying to avoid people, it's it's, it's annoying. And I know it's annoying all the way around. So it's like wear a mask. No, it's a good point. Well, do this. Do Especially that. people exhaling that stuff too. It's really important. So yeah, yeah. Thank you, Jason. We'll keep an eye on it. Now, something to pay attention to. Um, and yeah, I'm here seeing Cora type in here about regular smokers in uh, Rector Park and smoking while resting on the lawn. You all of it, all of it they're doing and all of that's parkland and, and they should not be doing it. So if, if this, if the, uh, allied universal folks can remind them of that, I guess they get frustrated. Where are they supposed to go? Stand in the street and, and smoke. Is that okay? Actually, that's true. They're supposed to be out of the park. Yeah. So they're supposed so, to be yeah, outside yeah, and yeah. there's no smoking inside. So. <laughs> no, in parks. Absolutely. So we'll, we'll just, we'll move them along. See if you can pay it. Yeah. See if you can help them pay attention and understand and uh, carefully. Um, all right. Anybody have anything else? Um, anybody have any questions about anything else or no? Can we wrap it up and call it a night? Oh, Justine, I'm sorry. I had one thing. I know it's, it's late, but Eric very kindly emailed me um, and I wrote him back during the meeting. But uh, we do indeed have that application into DOT for open streets. We're hopefully going to be in the next tranche of announcement. Um, oh. That the mayor makes. This is uh, about the, uh, the river terrace idea. Yes. Um, so we'll let you know uh, when we have that set with any luck, we may be able to coordinate with the first precinct slightly in advance to kind of kick the tires on it a little bit. But once we have it up and running, we will certainly let the community board know and uh, we welcome your feedback. We want to see how people like it. But I think the theme of the evening has been the more open public space, the better. And we yeah. want to try and deliver that for you. Yep, I think that was that. Well, that was a very important thing. I think that maybe if you can find out and you bring it up um, in the you know, bring it up and put, keep Betty K in the chat. So it might be something that she'll want to be interested in, even if it's the transportation committee that it gets discussed quickly, it'd be a place to yeah, have it for discussed. Sure. For sure. Um, so yeah, Betty, we can keep on talking. But anyhow, if that's it, I think I can call the meeting. Yeah, anybody have anything to say? Woohoo, I think we're done. And I think that calls, I, I don't believe we're scheduled to meet in August. So I think that, um, we will see you at the full board meeting and then see you guys 
back in September. Yeah. Uh, there will be one North Battery Park resiliency meeting, I believe, scheduled towards the end of the month. If people want to take a look for that. Okay, cool. So then Lucian, uh, Lucy, send it around so we know about it. But otherwise. Exactly. Thank you, everybody. This is Eddie, you, you want to say something? I see you popped yeah. up. One one last question uh, from the board office. Uh, it, when you're filling out the sign in sheet, if you're not a member, if you're a member of the public and you want to join the email list, um, you mark, please add me. I'll, I'll definitely start giving you the weekly uh, agendas, which also contains lots of really great uh, community newsletter items. A lot of things are shared from the Battery Park City Authority and around the district as well. Um, especially during COVID-19, we, we put a lot of good updates in there. Uh, you can also sign up for the email list uh, right from the live.mcb1.nyc website uh, when you log into the meeting. There's a there's a, a way for you to do that as well. So if you want to know as soon as we put that on the schedule, please sign up for that list and you will be informed. Okay. Betty, anything? Or are you just saying goodbye? Yeah, I was just going to wave goodbye. All right, cool. Well, well Patrick, Pat, thank you for, for being on here. Nick, Eric, everybody, and, and uh, Bob Zach, who's gone already, and Cora, everybody who signed on, thank, thank you so you. much. Thanks. You did it all, and uh, take so care. Yeah, <laughs> yeah happy, happy Fourth of July. Thank uh, you, everyone. Uh, happy Fourth. Uh, is Lucian still there?